Ahoy hoy everybody and welcome to Talking Simpsons where there are dark forces at work. I'm your host Dilbert Tie owner Bob Mackey and this is our chronological exploration of The Simpsons who is here with me today. Henry Gilbert and I'm still coughing up spare change. And who is on the line? I'm Matthew J. Everybody ska! And today's episode is the Mission Hill episode pilot or the douchebag aspect. Ah, so this is Mission Hill. Don't get excited. It doesn't have anything you would like. Well, it looks very colorful. So yes, we're taking a massive swerve as we've done in the past. We're introducing our newest miniseries in the Talking Simpsons feed because we have hit Mission Hill in the Talking Simpsons timeline. Mm -hmm, Yes, we were probably going to get to it right before we resume season 11. But right before that, uh, I know we're not exactly done with season one yet, but we're about to launch a brand new thing on the Patreon. So it is the perfect time to go back for one week to 1999. That's right. And so if you want to listen to the rest of these, they will be on patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. And if you sign up for $5, episode two will be there on Friday. And then every Friday after that, we'll be going through the entire series in order. And that will only be on patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. Yeah, it's just like our previous ones for the so far first 23 episodes of Futurama, the first season of King of the Hill, the entire series of The Critic. We did all of those in the Talking Simpsons style as exclusive miniseries. And this is our first one for 2020. Yeah, and our fifth uh, miniseries so yeah, far in as, this Patreon. As chosen by our voters, you know, it was close uh, in the poll between this and King of the Hill Season 2 Part 1, but I guess our, our dirtbag listeners <laughs> couldn't couldn't say no to Mission Hill. And joining us on this podcast is the ultimate Mission Hill fan, Matthew J. Hello, Matthew. Welcome. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's high praise. Uh, very few things are so specifically targeted at my brain than the show about layabout Gen X dirtbags that's drawn like 90s alt comics and has tons of ska music in it and deep references to like RPGs and video games and shit. Like this is exactly the show made to pump endorphins into my body and I'm Mm -hmm. very excited to come here and talk about it. Thank you for asking me. So this episode aired on September 24th, 1999 and as always, Henry will tell us what happened on this mythical day in real world history. We interrupt this trivial program to bring you important world news. Oh boy, Bobby, Jean-Claude Van Damme is arrested for suspicion of drunk driving. Nine Inch Nails' long-awaited double album, The Fragile, is finally released. And Family Feud is back, baby, as Louie Anderson hosts a new series. Oh, delightful. I had a friend absolutely ruin Nine Inch Nails for me. Oh, really? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, One of those friends, like, uh, when you're a teenager, you have these friends, you come over, and they just make you listen to songs. Mm, Oh, All of of their favorite music, and you're just sitting there bored, like, can I play Mario Kart or something? It's like, no! (laughs) The perfect drug is awesome! (laughs) I was doing that to people with Mission Hill episodes Uh, uh, as a teenager. Well, at least that's audio and visual together. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like you should be at least doing drugs together if you're listening to There weren't any drugs! uh, That's uh, unlike all the drugs Jean-Claude Van Damme enjoyed, which uh, he's... (laughs) I think back to the oral history of the Street Fighter movie I remember reading where they just straight up say like, oh yeah, and I saw Jean-Claude Van Damme just do it rails like <laughs> on, on the flight <laughs> and man we've had a lot of family feuds in our lifetime haven't we yes uh did we start i mean i think i grew up in the post dawson era i think dawson probably he was I bet he was still doing some of his last seasons when we were alive, but... That Roy Combs guy, was that his name? The late Roy Combs. Yeah, yeah we, we... He was our guy first, and then uh, after his passing, I think they gave Family Feud a little break for a while, and then Louis Anderson was the big return. Then after him, I think it was Al Borland, and then... <laughs> He has a name. <laughs> Sorry. Richard Karn. Richard Karn. Thank Put you. some respect on his goddamn name, Henry. <laughs> and uh, then I think it was the guy, fr- uh, Elaine's boss from uh, John Hurley from uh, Seinfeld, Mr. Peterman. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And then it became Steve Harvey, and he's just owned it for like uh, the last 10 years, I think. I love those videos. I think Vic Berger makes them, or somebody does, where it's just uh, him just looking miserable at the yes. camera. I mean, I, 
know it's kind of like a bit, but he hates these like regular Americans he's forced to interact with. You could tell. He, I mean, he probably sets aside two weeks a year to film 17 a day. They definitely do. And then once it's over, he's like, I'm free again for another year. I mean, uh, so this is a uh, family feud, right? Yes, the, the feud. I was thinking yes. of Hollywood Squares, never mind. But I bet like in the old days, like on Hollywood Squares, they did film 10 in a day and at lunch everyone got tanked. Oh, yeah. 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 I, <laughs> uh, but yes, Lou, uh, that was what was happening as the new season of television was beginning all across America in September 1999. The era of the Dreamcast. Uh, oh, God, yeah. The Dreamcast was like uh, two weeks old when this episode aired. We were playing Final Fantasy VIII, getting ready for Mission Hill to yes. launch. Yeah, wow. This was 15 days after the all-important 9999. The biggest day in entertainment history, yeah. according to EGM. <laughs> uh, I was freshly turned 17, the age of one of the characters in this, and so, uh, or... He's maybe 16, I, I forget, but I I was Kevin's age, so when I first saw this, I was the perfect age to see it. For Same sure. here. Yeah, and uh, you grew into it, Matt, but you were the right age when it started airing in uh, in its second life, I, I would assume. Uh, yeah, I would say so. I, I did watch it on the WB. Oh, wow. Uh, it, it comes out in a very weird time where between the ages of like 9 and 16, I watched anything that aired on TV, particularly anything animated, especially anything animated for adults. Like, that's, that's what my other podcast, The Deep End, is basically about, is about I have all this built up knowledge about Dilbert and, and Duckman and, and <laughs> things like that. That, that like no generation 10 minutes younger than me will ever care about like in, in the universe but my friend Steve Yurko and I have to talk about it for 90 minutes every week but uh I watched it on the WB I probably didn't remotely appreciate it as much as uh, I would yes on Adult Swim that's when I really like and that's when I rediscovered it and I started showing it to all my friends that's when I found out about the music rights issues and how they mm. were airing them where well, the DVD was weird and I would like I I always have on my hard drive just in case a uh, <laughs> a copy of it that's the DVD rip with the TV audio put back onto it so I can listen to the toaster while I watch it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> since it aired, it's been kind of a part of my life because that's also the time of the WB where like, I believe it's not that long after Baby Blues airs as well. I was I was a fan of that show. It's a weird time of the WB where they bought all these shows when they had no idea what their audience was. They were like, first WB starts out and they're like, it's we're making a network uh, for a black audience because that doesn't exist and then they you know got all the weigh-ins is in there and stuff and then that didn't work so they're like okay uh maybe the same sitcoms everyone else makes and they started making all those and that didn't work and then like one tree hill hits and they're like okay we figured yes. it out we're uh, just for teens like we're for white teens now <laughs> and in that time mission hill got bought and produced and <laughs> gets just totally fucked because the network is like we have no room for you anymore. Get out of here. Platypus Man was not their Seinfeld. <laughs> no. Well, yeah, like UPN scooped him on the urban market, as it were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mission Hill was just left in a in a tough position. I definitely watched this the first week and the second week. I it did just kind of leave my brain after. I mean, I liked it, but I was like, oh, I guess it just went away, like TV shows do. And I love obviously mega huge Simpsons fan mm -hmm. when this aired, but uh, I wasn't as knowledgeable about the creators of stuff so i probably did see some ad somewhere that said from producers on the simpsons that drew me to this as well but i did not know about bill and josh our favorite simpsons writers at the time i think every animated show was promoted that way because it was true yeah just like there was at least one producer who worked on the simpsons like they could legally say that about baby blues jeff, yeah. jeff martin was a, a mm -hmm. showrunner on it so yeah my shameful secret about this is, so I saw, I think, the second episode when it aired. This was famously, like, not promoted very well. Yes. And I wasn't mm -hmm. really watching a lot of uh, late night TV, especially WB, although I did like their cartoons. Uh, so I think I saw part of the second episode. I was like, oh, this looks neat. Then it disappeared, as we mm -hmm. all know. And I totally missed it when they burned off, uh, you know, some of the episodes in the summer. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I guess I just came in when I read about it online. Oh, it's like, oh, uh, that's sad. I wish I would have seen more of that. Then it came on Adult Swim, and I didn't like it. 
Oh. And because I I knew about the Simpsons and the inside, uh, I hadn't I hadn't really heard the Bill and Josh commentaries yet. But I was like, oh, these guys did my favorite stuff, and they left to make this. Mm. And Mike Scully took over the worst man on earth. <laughs> of course, this is what I thought twenty years ago. Yes, so we, I was we like, love Mike Scully. Yeah, now. <laughs> but I was like resentful. Like, why did you leave? Why did you give the the show to this awful man? And I didn't like it, even though I watched it all. And then I got the DVDs via Netflix in like 2007 or 2008. And I was like, oh, uh, I've lived a little more of my life. I'm a little more like Andy than I was like Kevin before. Mm. And I get it now. And I think this time I watch it, I'm definitely going to love it because I have lived all of the Andy life experiences, (laughs) like trying to make a a bizarre, ridiculous job work in a big city. Yeah, Mm. yeah. I think we we grew into uh, living the life of Andy, I think all three of us. Uh, and I think it did speak to me to a degree in that it was I could easily identify with the nerdy character who is struggling to get into cooler social circles. Like I was trying to befriend the cooler kids on my block, despite knowing I was a giant nerd. Like I, I uh, was a bit similar to Toby from this show back in, uh. in high school. <laughs> and, uh, and I also, I didn't realize this until doing the research, but like freaks and geeks premiered the next day. Wow. Like, wow. The what, next a, day. what a week. <laughs> so yeah. uh, that was the other show that I uh, obsessed much more about in 1999 that was also speaking to me as like, you're a fucking loser and a dork. You want to be cool with the burnouts. Here's stories about that. Like those, those Mm -hmm. both really spoke to me. You know, I think it probably helped that I was reading TV guide a bit then or other good reviewers who were just like, this is the about freaks and geeks. This is the best show on TV. Nobody watches. And that did make me want to watch it more knowing it's like the broken toy. And (laughs) uh, but mission Hill didn't even get that. Like, you know, and yeah, then- it's part of this long lineage of uh, uh, it's one of the shows that taught television a very bad lesson, which is animated sitcoms are about either children or people who are married and have a house and have children. And there's no in between. And for some reason, people keep trying the in between of people who are in their late teens or in their 20s or even like in their early 30s. And they all get canceled. There's just this huge, there's a mass grave uh, in the late 90s through the 2000s of great shows that got to go one season like Clone High, like this, like MTV's Downtown that are for an audience that doesn't get these things made for them, but also pre-streaming that audience didn't watch television. There were not a lot of early 20 somethings watching like 8 p.m. on the WB on a Tuesday. So those shows always tank and got canceled and then people would find them later. I want a renaissance of that now that we have streaming and people that age are watching a lot of television. But uh, for some reason, like those shows never stick and they're Mm. exactly what I need. And when I was of that age, there was nothing like that being made for me and I would have to go back to shows like this. And although now that age is... Millennials are we're in our 40s and don't have uh, like, you know, a very good job market or housing market or anything. So we actually can't even live the dirtbag life that no way. The people live in these shows anymore, which uh, I saw is that a yeah. bummer. I saw that apartment in this. I'm like, no way. Even with yeah. two roommates or I guess I don't think Kevin paying rent pays rent, though. Yeah, but parents uh, pay the rent. Yeah, they, they send money. Yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah, this <laughs> made I mean, not to get too ahead of ourselves. This made me yearn for living in this kind of place in the 90s before mm-hmm. i mean in the in the you know end of history you know the brilliant era where everything was at peace at least we thought so and just mm-hmm. there was so much culture before it was all stamped out by corporations <laughs> and big tech moving into cities and destroying them as we're and experiencing 9/11. here and 9/11. Yeah. oh yeah i mean there's a, many forces at work not not to get ahead <laughs> of ourselves in the miniseries but there's an episode that kind of presages 9-11 in mission hill yeah. <laughs> which is really oh, there's, eerie there's an episode i've been thinking about a lot the last couple weeks yeah <laughs> I think so. <laughs> that shot of like Andy, like with his arms outstretched and like happy as the world in crisis thing is behind him. That reminds me of like my what's going on with me now. Like my life is great, <laughs> but everything sucks and I can't be happy about it. 
<laughs> but you're right, Matt, uh, that this was kind of like a proto Adult Swim show, like the graveyard of late 90s animated series done after the boom of King of the Hill uh, really mm. helped Adult Swim with programming about yeah. three years later. <laughs> and Bill had a great uh, point on your interview, Matt. I don't know if we brought up that oh, interview yeah, folks yet. You should really listen to that on your Cartoons 101 Patreon. A couple years ago, you did a, an interview with Bill. We've interviewed Bill Oakley uh, a few times, but we're so Simpsons obsessed that by the end of it, we're like, well, there's five minutes left. Uh, Mission Hill. <laughs> That's pretty fun. <laughs> but but yours oh, yeah, was... I want to do specifically, I almost only talked to him about Mission Hill because people, for some reason, don't talk to him about it that much, even though he's incredibly vocal about it. He tweets about it all the time. He loves the show. They apparently want to or are trying to bring it back. Uh, Something's happening. Something's happening. But... Yeah, they're making <laughs> merchandise still. Like, they just started, like, two years ago, making official merch for Mission Hill because, you know, it never got the chance to have that. But he really believes in the show. I don't know if the show could exist today. Like, it would be very different, at least. I say on, uh, we did an episode about this show on, on our Adult Swim podcast, The Deep End. And I think it could exist today. The only thing I think is it can't not be incredibly political. Because it's, yeah. it's not an apolitical show, but it's not the most political show. But nowadays, people of that age are the most probably politically minded young generation that's uh, ever existed. And uh, I think you'd need to push a lot of that into it. I think that's the only main difference that you need to make and, and have it be about how hard it is to live a life like that now. Yeah, being a slacker is a very privileged position yeah, yeah. in this world. But back to your interview, mm -hmm. Matt, I thought it was really interesting. He pointed out in your interview that uh, there was an animated show explosion at that time, but there was also an every show explosion. Like right before <laughs> yeah. reality TV was the thing you made very cheaply, made a lot of money off of. Executives thought there was lots of money in sitcoms, make enough of those to get syndication deals and so on. And animated shows are just part of that. There were way more sitcoms made that you don't remember than the like 10 animated shows of this era. Yeah. It helped all these animated shows that they have to order 13 and they can't just be canceled in four episodes like all the Dharma and Greg wannabes that were uh, the contemporaries of Mission Hill. So 13 episodes have to exist in Mission Hill, uh, unlike a live action show where you can just strike the sets a few episodes in and just release everybody. But yeah, I guess to get into the history of this show and how it came together, which your interview is, is very helpful. Uh, it uh, Bill Oakley reveals several things I did not know uh, before. Regular Talking Simpsons listeners, I don't think need much explanation about the lives and uh, careers of Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein. Yeah, we have several interviews. I think we've interviewed Bill three times and Josh twice. Yes. <laughs> so... Um, uh, yeah, and uh, more to come, I'm sure. Yes, um, we'll never leave them alone. But the short version is that they were childhood friends who turned into comedy writing partners. Bill went to Harvard. Josh went to Stanford. Bill worked on the Harvard Lampoon. Josh is an honorary member of it. I believe he went for like a summer uh, and, and wrote for the Harvard Lampoon. And they had very like circuitous post-college careers of trying to get into comedy, but eventually were able to sell, uh, based on a spec script, a first freelance job for The Simpsons and then fully staff writers on Simpsons by the end of season four. They were the first Simpsons fanboys hired to The Simpsons, which makes them our favorites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But they really are just like great sitcom writers. Like their scripts for the shows between seasons four and six are some of the best episodes the show ever had. And when they took over uh, for season seven and eight, like they are amazing seasons. Like I think me and Bob are pretty much agree five and six are probably our favorite seasons, but seven and eight are right behind They're very, it. very good. Yeah. I like the mix of uh, Merkin and Oakley and Weinstein together. Yeah, Their yeah. sensibilities, like in this weird uh, cocktail. And they, they basically feel like in, in seasons five and six that there's like six episodes that Bill and Josh just kind of ran themselves. Yeah. <laughs> like mini seasons within the Merkin seasons but yeah, yeah the can I talk about them as fanboys real quick sure uh, because uh, I know this is well worn territory on, on Talking Simpsons but yes they were the first fanboys of the Simpsons hired to write for the Simpsons and the they were the uh, kind of the only ones to do that correctly because they were fans of it as like a television show and as, a, as of course it was a cultural phenomenon but it wasn't like what uh, a third of our economy was based on yet like it is now <laughs> but uh they loved it and they, what they brought to it as fanboys were we know what the audience wants out of these characters so mm. we know like what developments we want them to make we know like what we, we we know what would make us happy to see homer and and marge and bard and, and everyone accomplish now the entire writing staff other than the 60 year old harvard grads are that 
And it's really bad because mm. they aren't bringing that sensibility. They're bringing like, oh, I love Mr. Plow. Let's put Homer in his Mr. Plow jacket here. Uh, and let's also have Marge say, like, weren't you Mr. Plow? And he'd say, no, I wasn't, because Homer also <laughs> dumb. So, like, I am still, as I said on Talking Simpsons a couple weeks ago, I am watching all of The Simpsons because and now because I can't leave my house. But uh, I'm in season 22. Ooh. And uh, the show is built out of that. Like, it is only Homer. You've been an astronaut. No, I wasn't. I don't remember being an astronaut. Like. That's all it is. It's just reference upon reference. And they didn't do that. Like they're, they built uh, more history out of it. Like they found, yes. they found them as starting points instead of just referential stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, now the show is just like this Ouroboros swallowing itself. <laughs> that's just like, oh, we need to have a sequel to uh, Camp Krusty that doesn't actually matter about camp. Like, yep. and also retcons the end. And yep. I, it's just it's hard to it's get although like, yeah we found a little pocket in season 20 that was like a few really funny episodes in a row and then it just went away again i mean uh this is maybe two or three years ago there was also like a team homer sequel but homer's bowling oh, yeah. team was completely different than it was in team homer i'm like just yeah. watch the yeah. episode first yeah it's like if you if you want to do it then do it like that i mean when we've i i got the feeling from talking with bill and josh in in our interviews that it was important to them to know that like no the last time we saw this character they said this or i i think about how when Krusty reveals that he is Rory Bellows and he swims through the water and his normal face makeup washes away and he has his real skin, which is not makeup. Mm -hmm. That is a pointless thing. If you're not a mega fan, like it actually probably confuses viewers if it's their first Simpsons, (laughs) but it's incredibly important to like, no, they know that that's not makeup and it's important to show that. And it's a plot element Mm -hmm. too. It's not just fan service. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, it should be said that uh, Bill and Josh, uh, they had long hours at the Simpsons. People were staying until like two or three in the morning. Uh, uh, and that's not great for uh, like work-life balance, but I guess good comedy came out of it. In, in this case, it did. Yeah. There's probably a lot of tortured comedy writers who didn't write anything funny. But yeah, uh, if you're if you're a 28 year old uh, childless unmarried comedy writer, you probably have a lot more energy <laughs> than a 60 year old man with like an alimony and kids and a wife and a family mm-hmm. and a mansion. Kids probably yeah. soon too. Yeah. <laughs> They take over season seven and eight. Uh, they like Bill has been up front in, in your interview too of just like they thought it was the end. They figure Simpsons got like a year left, and <laughs> many Simpsons writers left for big fat development deals. So they do the same deal after their two years and sign up with Castle Rock to create sitcoms that would hopefully get bought by a network. Uh, now let's talk about Lauren McMullen a little mm. bit here. The uh, yeah, Barry, what an accomplished artist who I don't. I don't think I really appreciate it until we uh, really start working on these podcasts. But Lauren McMullen, guess what? Also a Harvard grad. Like, oh, it makes <laughs> sense. Well, the most talented people go there, right? Yes. Yeah. Is she <laughs> artist and most? Yeah, the most deserving people get to go there. She's apparently from the class of '86, so I think like even classmates with Oakley. And according to her LinkedIn, it's listed that she was even president of the Lampoon, which I had not heard before. Wow. She's almost like a co-creator of the show, and it's like mm-hmm. give her credit then. Come yeah. On. <laughs> I wonder if that's just like the way deal packaging goes. Of like, well it's they they wrote the pilot so they're the creator but in in matt's interview he does call her a co-creator but so like bill uh, morrison is a creator futurama yeah exactly (laughs) yeah instead of just designer or whatever uh oh yeah having seen the other side of that uh it sucks uh it's mm. very difficult to get the credit you deserve on a lot of things there's a there's also i mean nowadays it's even worse there's generally a very uh, difficult and stressful arbitration process Mm. that sometimes you can write a uh, very successful movie that is in theaters right now and not have your name anywhere on it. Mm. Uh, That's not me. It's someone I know, but it sucks (laughs) when that happens. So uh, Lauren, speaking of credit, she doesn't have much credited work on IMDb after graduating in the late 80s from Harvard. But the sense I get from looking at her LinkedIn and from reading a couple uh, interviews with her is that she was working primarily in commercials and bumper work in animation up until 1992. She was working at a place called Olive Jar Animation Studios, which I believe is still around. 
Uh, it was founded in 1984 and primarily did like commercials and bumpers, idents that were like both animated and stop motion. Like if you remember, say, a million different MTV or Nickelodeon idents from the 80s and 90s, like do you remember the one on MTV where a guillotine cuts off a head and it's a severed uh, head okay. and the MTV logo? Uh, they also did Coke and Miller Lite ads and a lot of other, other ads. So McMullen was working in that world. That's where she, she put her artistic work into. Uh, but she would leave commercials when former lampoon mates of hers but different ones al Jean and mike reese were starting their own animated series the critic and her episodes are gorgeous they're the best yeah they're, she's the best director on the critic it's crazy like when i look at her resume like she worked in all this commercial stuff so it's not like she's unexperienced in animation but she is like a border on the pilot and then directs a little devil do you like her move from boarding to directing is a uh not typical in the world of animation it's amazing how many uh just some of the best tv animation directors were on the critic like yeah. chuck sheets rich moore her and other people just crazy how they got so many people together like all the best rough draft associates oh yeah her little deb will do ya what a great episode and she directed the roger uh, ebert gene siskel episode as well so basically oh, two of the best of the critic yeah. And so funny too. Like, <laughs> like she has such a talent for visual comedy that's so good. And the visual, the look of this show is so integral to what it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she also really. Are we on her working on Mission Hill yet, or do you want? To oh well, no, I, I can get there soon. But yeah, so Take your time. Uh, I was... love her. I love her so much. <laughs> Take as much time as you want. I love Laura McMullen. Uh, so she though credited herself as L. H. McMullen early in her career uh, to quote her reasoning for it. I went with the credit of L.H. McMullen and changed it later. At the time, I wanted to be taken at face value like E.L. Konigsberg, which uh, was a noted ch- children's author of like the 60s up till the 90s. Uh, and not unlike J.K. Rowling as well. Women in the arts uh, can sometimes just want to go by a name that is gender neutral because if you people assume you're a man, then they don't come at you with a lot of judgments. So mm-hmm. I still know writers that do that. That's like still a thing and. It- it, it sucks. Now, I, I know a fr- friend of mine who I just had to get used to calling them uh, by their initials because that was their their work identification. Not that not that she's ashamed of being a woman or anything, but it, it eventually just grew into her brand. So she worked on The Critic. She also used some of her stop motion skills to be the director of the Hanukkah Town sequence, uh, too. <laughs> I <Yeah>. hope Shlomo. <laughs> and after The Critic got canceled, she went right over to the nanny that's awesome uh i just listened to the gayest episode ever's podcast about the nanny and i was like I gotta listen to that. you know what i really like the nanny let's watch the nanny yeah. again in these trying times uh fran- oh and she's fucking cool she's like a socialist and stuff now it rules no i love that about fran drescher and she's a 10 out of 10 smoke show she is uh, hell yeah uh, hell yeah but yes in 1995 the nanny did a holiday special called oi to the world oh why not like the classic ska song mm. oi oi of OI to the world. Laura McMullen wasn't just the credited director. She's also animation timer, background designer, character designer, color designer, and storyboard. Was that done a rough draft, I'm guessing? It was a rough draft. I thought so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you watch it, you can tell it did not have the budget of a Simpsons episode or a critic episode, let's say. It even looks very like early digital animation for TV, but I think it's fine. For a 1995 Christmas special of a non-animated series, I think it's it's fine. The designs are cool. Yeah. Well, and then she could go off of the opening animation to the nanny show which was all about her boyfriend kicked her out in one of those crushing scenes oh yes that's right she was out on her fanny henry (laughs) thank you (laughs) that that would be censored in in the uk she was out on her uh bum (laughs) uh but yes uh after that christmas special the next job she has on imdb we're directing two episodes of the second season production wise the king of the hill oh yeah three days of the condo which is the one where they uh, have to cross the border illegally back into America. That one's great. And the second of the two-parter, Death of a Propane Salesman. Oh, that's a great... Oh, man, I can't wow. wait to do more Talking the Hill. Not to get too far ahead of ourselves. I love doing Talking <laughs> yeah. Mission Hill. They're both uh, hills. Yeah. <laughs> I think Andy is king of the Mission Hill. <laughs> Talk the same talk. You are whack. 
You don't know what that means, do you? They walk the same walk. Don't you love that new binder smell? Yes, my fondest high school memory. That and getting two brothers with nothing in common until now. Are we going to be your roommates? No! From producers of The Simpsons. Who wants to get it on? You are so lame. Mission Hill, coming this fall to the WB Friday Night. Uh, but so they, she's working on King of the Hill. At the same time, Bill and Josh are working at Castle Rock, developing an animated series that their old friend Lauren would be perfect for. Uh, Oakley even mentions her as a co-creator. She comes on and really helps them develop the art style of it and just so much of the spirit of the show. And the brief version is Bill and Josh have explained it many times is when they worked on The Simpsons, they realized there were no young adult characters other than like Otto and Jimbo, maybe. <laughs> And also, you know, taking inspiration from, like, the indie film boom that was going on at the time. Like, they specifically reference things like Welcome to the Dollhouse and Chasing Amy. Plus, the indie comics boom of Peter Bagg's Hate and Daniel Klaus's 8-Ball. Way more Peter Bagg. I mean, this... I think they should have... Peter Bagg should have gotten royalties for this cartoon. Just I, with I, how I think, think that, too. It's, yeah. it's very... I've seen people even use that as, like, uh, a slight against the show. It's like, they just may look like Peter Bagg. It's still... It's different enough, but it is very heavily inspired by his work. Yeah, it's it's like the say I would say this in a non uh, non patronizing or non insulting way. It's the TV safe version of Peter mm-hmm. Bag's work. Like if you put hate on TV, and there is a, a short pilot online you can watch. No mm-hmm. WB viewer would watch a character that ugly and cruel. <laughs> and I love the hate comics, but man, you can't really do a hate series. Yeah, and Bill said, I think on, I think he says in that interview I did with him that hate is his favorite comic book ever. Yeah. He's like a comic guy. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's intentional. I wish they'd have cut him a check, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, have you seen Buddy Bradley's nose? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on the commentary on the DVD, there's a great bit where he says, like, we thought these were very popular comics to us, but then we find out they sold like maybe 10,000 copies and <laughs> they, they were not that famous. But yes, also Lauren took a lot of inspiration from her own, like, kind of bohemian artist life and the, uh, that her and her friends led like they talk about how the loft is based on an apartment she was living in as an adult with other artists too also they took a ton of inspiration from the cool communities all around america from san francisco's mission district to chicago's wicker park to brooklyn's williamsburg and boston's own mission hill yeah i think on uh, matt's interview he said it's basically wicker park that's where they went in chicago they uh, took pictures of it uh, for it, but it's also influenced by other cities too. Uh, and it just, man, it made me so excited to like someday I'll live in a cool city. And now, you know, I've lived in Berkeley for 15 years and I'm I'm like the old townies in, in Mission Hill are just like, man, yeah, I live here. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I always thought I would move here to LA and live in like Silver Lake. And every time I'm there, I do think like, oh, I'm in Mission Hill right now. And now I live in Burbank, which is the most, it's the place that Tim Burton uh, uh, takes all his inspiration from to be like, no, this is the, the normie boring place. And I'm like, I fucking love it here. <laughs> this is the best part of LA. So yes, they are working on the show together, Castle Rock. Going by the timeline of Variety articles on this, it was July 1997 where it was first announced that Bill and Josh made the deal with Castle Rock for this, reportedly in the range of $5 million. So, mm. you know, big payday for those guys. And they, as Oakley put it, they wrote the pilot script. They shopped it around to networks, and once they had a meeting with WB, they just loved the pilot and ordered it directly to 13 episodes. Just boom, like that. Like, in- insane. I mean, at the time, in late 1997, the WB was still a startup network that hadn't really figured itself out yet. So in Variety, March 16th, 1998, it is officially announced with the uh, working title of Brothers hmm. in uh, the article. I'd asked Oakley about this on Twitter, a while ago and he was like yeah that was just so temp that they were just told we have to have something in this article so just call it brothers they never mm. were gonna call it that's brothers. before the wayne's brothers <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they did want to call it the downtowners which uh, it was mm. for a time and then uh, unfortunately the mtv downtown had to come out months before it came out and so they they changed it to the more straightforward mission hill so on July 27th, 1998, Variety also has an interview with WB exec Jamie Kellner, 
there talking up the uh, the Netlet's future, and uh, the Downtowners gets a brief mention. Jamie Kellner, if you're on uh, like Rec Arts Animation, the news group, or just reading message boards in the late 90s, he was hated by yes. all cartoon fans. Uh, oh. he, he killed a million cartoons. I mean, he doesn't like cartoons. He doesn't. Well, okay. Jamie Kellner also killed WCW Wrestling. When he transitioned from being the WB exec to a different part of Warner to be the head of TNT, he instantly, in, two, in the start of 2001, he was like, I don't want wrestling. This is garbage. Like, this is a bad demographic. Jamie Kellner feels, you know, one demographic and can sell to it well and that's young teens and so once Buffy and Dawson's Creek and all those started really hitting it shows that for weirdos was not particularly wanted by Jamie Kellner whether it be the downtowners or WCW Nitro either of those Jamie Kellner not a fan of if you read that article like the downtowners gets a brief mention while it's entirely Kellner talking about like man Buffy and Dawson doing so well we're <laughs> moving the time slot for Dawson up an hour it's gonna be great it's like oh the the writing's on the wall like already uh they're still working staffing up in mid-1998 getting writers animators and voice actors uh many of the folks from behind the scenes on simpsons would come over like if you you see in the credits you'll see the sound guys for simpsons crystal desma and travis powers mm. also worked on this and same with like pretty much the u.s production was all handled out of film roman just like the simpsons and king of the hill were doing and uh, overseas animation was handled by two studios Acom, Acom did this one, but also a Korean studio I'd never heard of before and I cannot find any information on, uh, but it's called New Millennium. Either they changed their name or they, they didn't do a bunch, but uh, ironically, they find. closed in 2001. <laughs> I actually don't know. They that. were not Sorry. ready. They were not ready for the New <laughs> Millennium. And a fantastic voice cast. So good. Like starting with Wally Langham uh, as Andy French. I still don't really know who he is, but I love his voice as Andy. Uh, clearly not a Veronica's closet viewer then oh no i mean i'm sure i just another one of those fucking shows that when i was like 11 i was like well it's on television i better watch it i'm sure i watched like two seasons based on pure momentum like seinfeld like pushed me into it i was just tumbling through veronica's closet at 9 (laughs) 30 he was one of the writer characters on larry sanders which he was he was very Mm -hmm. good at in there though his his characters usually are like in veronica's closet and larry sanders his characters were noted for being uh, thought of as gay and pe- and he was constantly like, no, I'm not gay. Like, I think that's been a curse on Wally Langham's life that he is ostensibly a, uh, an effeminate straight man or, uh, hey, there are lots of us out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, He's been on a bunch of stuff. He also was on law and order or no CSI. I mean, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. for a while, but he, he has such a distinctive voice that I, I really wish he'd do more voice acting. I, mm-hmm. I, I, can't think of another i think he's been in some video games and stuff but like he's not really done that much and he mostly just pops up on tv shows and he was in weird science and stuff but like his voice is amazing and this is this i talk all the time because i talk about the same era of animation on most of my shows (laughs) but there is a big shift happening right at this time where voice acting for cartoons was known as, oh, you do 40 silly voices Mm -hmm. uh, and you can cast one person as 40 characters. We start to see this shift right around here of like casting people for their voice uh, and for them actually playing the character with, with their natural voice, which can give, I'm not saying one's better than the other, but they, they can find a lot more avenues for like emotion and storytelling and things because it's naturally there within them. And some people survived that change some people have a harder time surviving it but like that's why steven universe sounds the way it does Mm -hmm. okay ko craig of the creek like modern cartoons have a full cast it's not like you know the simpsons which has like seven people (laughs) playing a hundred different characters it's definitely cheaper to hire one harry shearer than like seven people like that yeah uh one uh maurice lamarche playing every single celebrity on the critic (laughs) yeah uh well you talk about voice actors who do a lot of voices that's scott menville all over the voice of kevin well he does his one voice but he was born with that voice Mm -hmm. and um i'm a little conflicted about the voice because i think that was one of the reasons i didn't quite like the show it's a it's a bit much but I mean, it is Scott Menville's voice. He's playing it up a bit. Uh, I, I like it now, but I think it might have been a wiser choice because Andy has a uh, just a non-cartoony speaking voice, but everyone else in the world is a cartoon. Mm. I think it might have been a better idea to give that character a less cartoony voice because yeah. as of, I mean, in the final product, Andy is like the only normal voiced character. Like everyone <laughs> is just like a very mm-hmm. uh, played up voice. 
like Posey yeah, and Jim. Like, uh, Bob's not a fan of Full House. Uh, <laughs> oh no, Scott Menville's got some range. If you check out his his uh, recurring role in Full House, who was he on Full House? Boy. He was Kimmy Gibbler's boyfriend, who was also uh, a plumber uh, and was very dumb. And he would usually just say, uh, uh, "What did he say? I think he said all right or awesome, something like uh, that, okay. or like totally." Like he had a catchphrase that was just a word <laughs> that a dumb guy says. At uh, this point, he already though was a pretty accomplished voice actor too. Like he had played Freddie Flintstone on Flintstone Kids. He was wow. Red Herring on Pup Named Scooby Doo. Yeah, and uh, and who could forget Mati? He was Mati on Captain Planet. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you know, look, hey, they'd cast a different actor in that now, but he did a good job as uh, the heart, heartful kid, as uh, as would be revealed. They muted on the commentary, but uh, in other interviews, they revealed that Andy Dick almost was Kevin French, but I think Scott mm-hmm. was a better pick. Oh, there. yeah, it would have been just, I mean, the character would just be Andy Dick then. Yeah, You can't yeah. have an Andy Dick voice character and not be Andy Dick. <laughs> and he was also the main uh, the main character in the GameCube game Tales of Symphonia, which I played oh, a thousand yes. hours of. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, yeah. if you hear and Scott Menville, to be Robin, of course. Yeah, and he was shaggy for a short <laughs> amount of time. Like Scott Menville does his voice, but only he has it, so you yeah. can immediately recognize him in anything he does. He's he's mm-hmm. lived as Robin for about 50, 20 years now, twenty years straight. He's he's been the Robin of animated voice acting. Uh, yeah, we got, and he's on the Teen Titans show, and he is not an anti vaxxer which is uh, which is pop- kind of a rare commodity on that show. So I <laughs> really that. okay, I, uh, it's not uh, that rare, but it's mm. rarer than it needs to be. <laughs> uh, you got Brian Posehn as Jim, hot off of being on Mr. Show and mm. Just Shoot Me. At the I time just saw him do stand-up about 18 months ago. Still very funny. I love him. He's <laughs> turning into a regular Santa Claus, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we got Vicky Lewis as both Posey and Natalie uh, was just wrapping up news radio at the time this uh, was getting cast. And an accomplished mm-hmm. Broadway actor who now she's been on a million things since. Uh, speaking of animation voice acting lifers, you got Tom Kenny, Tress McNeil, Nick Jameson filling out a lot of the other regular voice actors. So if people didn't hear my Sam and Max Hit the Road episode of Retro not i did a lot of research on nick jameson so he did the other celebrity impressions on the critic that maurice lamarche didn't do right mm-hmm. uh he was also the voice of sam in the sam and max video game did you know he only started voice acting in the 90s in the 70s and 80s he had a music career he is the fourth unofficial member of fog hat what and he what? plays on the album with slow ride he is the bass player on slow ride what yes <laughs> when you so hear cool. slow ride that. <laughs> that's him playing the bass the guy who does wow. the voice of mr sherman Wow. Yeah. He talked on the critic commentaries about not being a voice actor and <laughs> then wanting to play all these roles. And he's like, I kind of had to teach my voice how to do all those different voices. And mm. now he's like an accomplished, great voice actor. And he has like two solo albums, one in the 70s, one in the 80s. They're all on YouTube. So yeah. he had quite a life before he started voice acting in the 90s. Yeah. Damn. And he's great too. He like he sometimes it's hard to tell if it's him or Maurice doing some of the voices. Like they're both really good at at stretching their voices in all those different ways. And uh speaking of Tom Kenny, as of course, like any animation nerd, I'm a diehard Tom Kenny fan. I think mm-hmm. he's brilliant. Uh recently my co-host Steve, because he works on Rick and Morty, got to meet him. And said the same thing that I've always planned to say to him if I ever meet him, which is I'm going to bring up Mission Hill because mm-hmm. I think this might be peak Tom Kenny. I think this might be the best <laughs> he's ever been. And he's one of those guys, as I said, some people in the old school way of voice acting had trouble moving into the modern way of voice acting. I won't name any names on this podcast on mine. I do. Uh, <laughs> Tom Kenny d- has done it better than anyone like he mm-hmm. him and Maurice LaMarche, I think, are the two the two that figured it out the best from that era. Or, and Jim Cummings, of course, because mm-hmm. he's just fucking he's a genius. But like Tom Kenny can do the silly stuff, but put so much character and emotion into it. Where like, you're right. Some of his voices on here are so cartoony. And yet like the last episode of Mission Hill, which is one of, in my mind, the greatest episodes of television ever. Like you love that character so, so much and believe in everything that he says, even though he sounds like the old man on SpongeBob. (laughs) (laughs) God. Yeah. Just a great, I think Tom Kenny is able to adapt well too, because he has the improv comedy background. You know, Mm -hmm. he, he wasn't just a, you know, radio voice guy or whatever. Like it's a stand up (laughs) sketch comedy improv. He did it all. Yeah. 
So the show is primed for a Friday, September 24th, 1999 debut, uh, two days ahead of the season premiere of The Simpsons for season 11. It's going to debut at 9 p.m. with the lead-in of The Jamie Foxx Show, which uh, feels a bit mismatched and wasn't getting all that advertised. It would get a 1.8 rating. Which is uh, big for anything now. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. But but even then, by WB's low standards, that was low. Like, WB wasn't on as many channels, so they shouldn't get NBC ratings. But even compared to the Jamie Foxx show, it was a dip. And it was a real dip compared to what like Buffy would get on a mm. Tuesday. And that same night, it got murdered by Dateline and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. I was just going to ask you what the competition <laughs> was. I was like, was this like a Mad About You night? No, no. Well, mm-hmm. Friday, uh, if it wasn't TGIF, Friday is like murder show night uh, on every other channel. The murder show. Uh, but but yeah, for there, people that don't know, I believe a one is roughly a million, right? Yeah. Like, like basically a one is a million, so 1.8 is basically almost two million people. They uh, it, it would only get lower from there. We'll talk more about that later. As for post-Mission Hill, Lauren McMullen's career continued like just up and up and up. She'd go on to The Simpsons and direct some of the strongest looking episodes from 01 to 04. Like her episodes rule, at least animation wise, as I recall. And then uh, she also contributed a lot to the Avatar The Last Airbender series, which I did not realize until now. And then after that, she followed her old critic co-worker, Rich Moore, to Disney Animation Studios. Mm. On the theatrical side, uh, she worked as a story artist on both of the Wreck It Ralph films and Zootopia, and was the first woman solely credited as a director on a Mickey Mouse short and the Oscar nominated Get a Horse, which uh, and she's still mm. at Disney today. I would bet she's working on something that has yet to be announced. Uh, speaking of Avatar as well, I'm sure you'll get to this when you get to the episode he directed, but uh, Michael Dante DiMartino worked on this show, one of the co creators mm. of Avatar. It might be how they met. I would bet you're right. I would bet you're right. (laughs) Yeah, uh, I guess I was never really clear on what the broadcast schedule was for this show. And it's nuts. It's crazy. I didn't know how fractured it was. So it's like one episode airs and then like two or three weeks pass. Another episode airs and then like four or five are burned off in the summer. And like half of the series was a new show on Adult Swim. They had never aired. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, To think of how wasteful it was for three years that no episode like these episodes were just not seen. And then there were like five uh, produced in animatic that are online and i mm-hmm. think one had full animation produced and w- another one had an active animation produced so not finished or anything not scored or any any of the processes they do after that but animation was completed for these things oh, so so yeah. sad and wasteful all that for like they put all this work into it and you get one friday night and then it's just like well Failed on the first Friday night. The end. There's the axe. Get out of here. No one will see this. After spending like probably twenty million dollars so on much it, money. yeah. Oh god, it's. Uh, the, the, I can see why uh, this would drive uh, anybody crazy. Uh, having this happen to you. <laughs> Mission Hill Tuesday on DVD. Got something for me? Sure. How's this? For the slacker in all of us. Loser! 13 hilarious episodes and behind-the-scene extras. Mission Hill, the complete series. Buy it Tuesday on DVD. Now we've presented the history of it. Let's get into the first episode of Mission Hill again. Uh, thank you, Bob, for hooking me up with the versions that have the original licensed music. I liked this when I first watched it, and I did watch it on Adult Swim, but it wasn't until I was loving the Simpsons DVDs so much, and then the Mission Hill DVDs came out with their own commentaries. I was like, I have to own this, and that's when I truly fell in love with uh, with Mission Hill as a series. Clearly, they didn't have the kind of support a Simpsons DVD box that had, but I think the, the DVDs are definitely worth it, and Bill and Josh put as much work as they could into it. There's only like three commentaries, probably because... 
that's just all the space they have. Like, if it had had three discs instead of two, they could have probably done a commentary every episode. I'm guessing it's more like they had two hours at a studio somewhere yeah. that they weren't paying for. <laughs> I bet you're right there. But yes, the uh, the opening of the show, so great. Like, the, the instrumental version of the Cake's uh, Italian leather sofa. It's great. I'm, I'm in already. Yeah, <laughs> I love cake as a white man yeah, born in the found cake. Exactly, me too. And uh, it it sounds like a different version because the version on the album, of course, has lyrics. But I think they might have uh, used like an earlier version of it or a different version. It is different than the album version. Oh yeah, this it's was slower a, too. It, yeah, yeah. Well, this is a cool one of the many cool things. Bill and Josh, their twitters are fantastic for sharing secrets. Josh tweeted out like, "Hey, here is the." downtowners poster we had of the characters that was used on the cassette of this special version of the cake song that cake recorded for them. oh nice so cool this was a brand new studio recording cake did uh mm. so they were definitely honored to be the uh the opening theme to this show too whatever their 99 album was uh really good as the one that had uh, sheep go to hell yes on it. goats yeah. go to heaven uh, no no sorry one. sheep go to heaven goats go to hell that's right don't send yeah. sheep to hell they're pure <laughs> they did what the god told them to do they were Respected the words of uh, Jesus. Lots of great songs. No phone. Uh, approachable karaoke, by oh, the way. Okay. Again, this show is mm. made for lame-o, milquetoast white guys like us. Exactly. <laughs> it's like a fantasy for us. Uh, though it may, it, <laughs> Bob, I think you and I did a cake song at karaoke together once. Was this my wedding thing? I think it was. I think Maybe. so. I think at your wedding, we did that song together. One of those songs. I bet it, it was been, distance. Uh, Italian Love Sofa. And I was wondering what you guys think about this. So Bill Oakley's interview with you helped me a lot, Matt, because this show is a fantasy, an idealized like life in the city. Again, it's like mm-hmm. a version of hate that's like the good, like the happier version where mm-hmm. things work out. Like I was, I was grappling <laughs> yeah. with this when I watched it again. I'm like, is Andy too cool? But then I understand the point of it. So like, yes, this is the fantasy of living in a city. And then you see when you have a show like The Critic, the network's like, this character's a loser. Everyone (laughs) hates him. He never wins. So I can see why they like, let's have a successful character that's kind of a dirtbag, but he does get laid in the first episode. Or at least there's the chance there. He's not always Mm. getting turned down and losing in life. Mm -hmm. You know, he can talk to women. He doesn't completely hate himself he's got game he can screw over his boss like instantly i mean it's like i was just grappling like is he too cool but i understand why they made him cool though over time you scratch beneath the surface of andy he is a loser in a way i mean the dead end job is a is a problem too and the aimlessness the unemployment episodes like that's those are the dark nights of the soul for andy french i can't wait to get to those because i was not unemployed (laughs) until after i had watched those and they all made sense to me because i've been unemployed like three non-consecutive years of my working life <laughs> uh, just because we live in a hellscape in a terrible mm. economy uh that's not good to creative people but i can't wait to get to those again yes as the uh as also bill oakley has revealed in multiple interviews since like every eight episodes andy was going to have a different job and they had a very long arc planned for his character so i i like the first shot we see of him is at ron's waterbed world like this is the low point of him you know you got to have a day. Artists have day jobs, man. You don't just become a professional cartoonist. Yeah. Bill also says uh, in that interview that each job he gets after every eight episodes would be a little closer to his dream. And then he said at a certain point he would be Mac Raining. Uh-huh. Yeah. He might get a TV show and it would be very stressful and he'd hate it. <laughs> well, you see he has characters for a TV show uh, mm-hmm. drawn already. He's got ideas. Mm-hmm. I, An animated series. Everybody <laughs> and their brother has one of those. These these guys came from The Simpsons, and I love that they come at it with like, we need a ten year plan for this, like, which uh, <laughs> is sadly over ambitious for what they were going to do. But yes, also it's a clever way for the uh, pilot to introduce him. We just see a name tag that says, "Hello, my name is Andy French." And in the voice actors, one I didn't touch on though was uh, Jane Weedland of the Go Go's. Like, I looked at her resume and I am. DB, like not a lot more voice acting after this, even though she is just perfect as alternative dream girl Gwen in this show. Mm-hmm. She's more of a like a lucid pixie dream girl. Yeah, <laughs> not quite. Not really manic. <laughs> no, no, she's she's really chill. Like this is you know in the two thousands we wanted manic pixie dream girls to fix our lives and be very proactive. In the nineties, the dream was just like a chill girl. It's just like let's hang and like yeah. you know maybe fuck slack like, around. Uh, yeah, let's all slack it up and slack down. Here's our first scene with old Andy French. Hey, Ron, is it okay if I take off a little early today? 
I'm supposed to have dinner with my folks, and they're way out in the suburbs, so I... No way! Everybody's gonna stay late to inventory tonight! Nobody leaves early! Oh, Are you kidding me? But that's your job! Yeah, but I gotta leave early! I got a hot date with big, funny jokes, the kind I like. <laughs> <laughs> that jerk, he's always doing this to us. Clearly, this calls for drastic action. Okay, everybody, work's over, and nobody saw anything, right? Right! right. I like this intro of Andy. Like you talk about the differences with say Jay Sherman and him. Yeah. This first scene of him, like this is a cool thing. A slacker does in a movie of just like, Hey man, I'm going to help all you guys. So we can all get off early. I think the first thing we see of Jay Sherman is him being humiliated by everyone he works with. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> it's hair in a can. Yeah. That's the first shot of him here. We're seeing like, yeah, Andy has a shitty job with a crappy boss. Who's uh, like a vaguely ethnic, angry man. But he's not letting it get him down. In fact, he wins every now and then, you know, and and does it to help everybody else as a Spartacus or Popeye type. As he somehow be. doesn't get fired. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, and just got all the background characters like all over this. Like, talk about more great work they put into it. Like, they designed so many background characters. You watch that first season of Simpsons, just vague people everywhere with seemingly no guidelines of what they look like in the first four episodes. In this episode, so many characters that are so specifically chosen. They're not just tossed off background characters. They did a lot of work designing the city and the people first, I think. And what I like about the show, we didn't talk about the color design. It's just amazing. Like, you don't see these colors on Mm. TV. I don't think the color white exists in this world. Like, the the pupils of the eyes are yellow. The teeth are yellow. Like, it's a very (laughs) interesting world, the color choices. And it's like one of the last cell animated shows, yeah. too. Like, yeah. I love just the texture of it. <laughs> As they leave the place, Andy even has a, a cute little conversation with his on-again, off-again girlfriend of the series. That was great. You're the Spartacus of us wage slaves. Thanks. I always thought of myself more as Popeye, but Spartacus is good, too. Though it's not really fair to compare them, because they lived in different times, and... Would you like to go on a date with me? Uh, Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. Hey, how about Saturday? My roommates and I are having a party. Would you like to come as my date instead of as my co-worker? So, when you put the moves on me, it won't be sexual harassment? Exactly. It's a date. Ooh. I do enjoy the Gen X rumination about pop culture. <laughs> yes, yeah. That, <laughs> Andy is one of those cool guys who's all, he's like being too jokey and talky that he, he has to pause like, wait, oh, oh, uh, a girl's asking me out. Okay, reset. Like, <laughs> yes. Uh, I want to lean into my brand for a second and talk about how this show draws attractive women. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's this recurring thing. I talk about this a lot on my other show, too, that when a cartoon show is designed generally for adults, it's allowed to be a little ugly or weird looking or at least very stylized. I feel like it's always the second step to be like, OK, now how do we make people want to fuck these characters like they draw, <laughs> you know, Andy and Kevin and make them look like weirdos and they have like shaggy hair and you said like their teeth are yellow and stuff. Some shows it looks like uh, they put a sticker of a hot lady on it and it like doesn't fit. <laughs> Some shows find the way to do it. And this show, the way they do it is all the women are anchored with this circle that is their hips. Yeah. Uh, oh, like yeah. they have a circle that they draw everything out from. And it like it's kind of this like they look real and kind of frumpy and like real women. And that makes it like so much better and realer and feel great. And that's why this character was like one of my first cartoon crushes. I was so <laughs> in love with Jane Weedland's character on the show. And I think part of it is that and also just the like short hair mascara look that they give mm. a lot of the women on this show is just like really it's really great and really well observed and feels of the era but has aged really well she has a little baby fat on her gwen does i like that mm-hmm. about her design she's not just like the va 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 voom character or whatever yeah though definitely some uh, a number of men's fantasies for sure yeah she's not like a sexy <laughs> oh, yeah. re- a sexy redhead or an asian lady with like a purple stripe through her hair or whatever <laughs> like you'd see at the time like every mtv show had yeah the, i mean we're definitely thinking of undergrads here yeah i mean one. at yeah. least the the and asian yeah, yeah. The yeah. Asian woman that uh, Andy sleeps with in this series, she does not have the purple streak. Yes, yeah. yeah. She's just a regular lady. <laughs> uh, I also, there's there's so many great little animation gags here that I, I only really caught in 
closer inspection like seeing andy when he's trying to be cool like yeah yeah like he kind of leans on a <laughs> lamppost then he rethinks it like oh you know no 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 lean on lamppost that's not cool i like his little scarf it's a fun affectation oh yeah, yeah. It reminds me of things that i would do like oh this this button would be rather fetching <laughs> <laughs> and it does feel like walk it like just wearing your regular work clothes with one tiny little thing to make you just a little bit warmer puts it in like you know what day of the year this takes place mm. in a city like that it's it's just such a well observed and it's yeah. a show where people do get to change and it does feel like time moves like some episodes it's hot out some episodes it's cold out yeah they they also people do kind of have their uniforms but it's not weird if jim wears a different shirt or a jacket mm-hmm. on the show yeah again i was 17 watching this in 99 like the idea of like getting into a subway and not getting oh. into a car like that was a uh, alien to me could that be me one day <laughs> and it's it's been it's been me for the last 15 years for me now. i was yeah. like talking to a girl <laughs> <laughs> and i was 17 yes in the broadcast version the song that plays behind this amazing little walk sequence for andy is burning flies by looper it's a really nice song it was also referring back to your interview matt i love how bill oakley doesn't give a shit about music like on the simpsons Lollapalooza episode he's like these picks were all your guys's i i like old 70s <laughs> rock i don't care like same with when you asked him about this indie music he's like i left that to josh and other people like i don't care <laughs> i think his favorite band is mountain <laughs> Who wrote Mississippi Queen. <laughs> That's right. I think yeah. you're right. <laughs> yeah. But the soundtrack of this show is great. It's so great. Like it, it's it's not the top 40 kids teen music that you would just hear in every episode of Dawson's Creek. But just like on Dawson's Creek, when it got put on DVD, they didn't have the rights to any of these songs. I, I mean, I'm happy that at least on the DVD, they have the cake song. Like they, they still have the intro music anyway. The one thing that hurts mm-hmm. it ultimately is that like one episode episode the final joke is the song everybody hurts yeah and it's very odd on the dvd it's i'm glad we have the original version for that episode of talking mission hill i've heard you guys talk a bunch about the way that that episode ends with the rem song and i i just watched that version of it with someone that i was introducing mission hill to and we and just to make it easy i watched the youtube clips at, or the youtube uploads of it and i realized i don't think i've ever seen it without the real music and it's so jarring and annoying and bad and like it's not it, that's the only one that it really sticks out because other times you're like it just sounds like a tv show like the ska song in this episode sounds fine it's not the toasters but it's fine but like, yeah, that one, that clip is like people will hunt down that episode and just look at it if you're not familiar with it, because it's it, it shows you like how fucking hard it is to get old TV uh, available. Like there's so much crap you have to go through because the way we watch TV shows now, like didn't exist over a decade ago. I think we've learned don't base a joke on a licensed song because uh, I haven't watched the Hulu version of it. I'm interested in seeing what they did. But on Daria, there's an episode where there's like a extensive Everybody Hurts parody where they're just sort of panning across mm-hmm. characters like the video and having like subtitles oh, of what they're thinking. Right. And I'm like, boy, I wonder what they did. <laughs> I uh, have watched Daria on Hulu and it's bad. It's mm-hmm. really hard to watch. Just like The State. If you've ever watched The State on DVD or on Hulu, it's a lot of shows of this era, particularly MTV shows, because they were allowed to use whatever the music they wanted because that was part of MTV having the rights. It's same with WB, I guess, because this is also the era of like, you'd get to the end of an episode of a show and the credits would get pushed to the side and that guy would come in and be like, tonight's episode of Smallville has the new <laughs> uh, single by one sh- or by third eye blind. And <laughs> yeah. like, it's just a bummer because that's not how music rights work. You don't just get to use them whenever you want forever. Well, you know, back in 1999, WB, the broadcaster, they're ready to pay X amount of dollars for TV broadcast licensing rights for a song. But in 2005, is Warner Entertainment on DVD willing to pay that same amount or likely more to put it on a DVD for an unpopular show? No, Mm -hmm. probably not. Uh, You know, we get spoiled by like Simpsons. It was huge enough on DVD that they paid for every song. They're like, oh, we're going to have to relicense every song, including like a Chuck Berry song, which is impossible to get uh, back then. They're like, we got to find Chuck Berry and (laughs) hand him money to get the rights to the Beatles song. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Golden Slumber is getting to use that. But they did it for Simpsons because it's that big. But Mission Hill and a million other shows like they, they would not do that Mm -hmm. i have a conspiracy theory about that because as everyone knows in the michael jackson episode of the simpsons him talking was him but him singing was a sound alike yeah yeah 
I think that also has weird rights issues tied into it. And I think that's part of the reason they pulled that episode from everything. Mm -hmm. I think they're like, they're like this. We don't actually care if he did anything to anyone, but this is a good excuse to stop paying whatever we have to pay extra for that because it has singing in it. Well, yeah, a year later, he's all over the radio again, like nothing happened after after the documentary. So that that could definitely be it. Uh, Yeah. But in happier news, I love the shot of it. This is the like the young person in a city fantasy. Like this is so cool. Just him walking. They let you breathe it in and like the world, the people, the stores. Like it's such a pleasant shot before he's almost Mm -hmm. murdered by an air conditioner. Oh God. The show really takes its time, which I think also is a thing that I love about it and the background design that you mentioned uh, a minute ago there's an upcoming one that I really want to talk about when they're talking to their parents but the background design in this one of him walking through it like he passes by his local bodega and takes the free weekly free weeklies are dead now like, they're just all like sex time. ads for the <laughs> most part now <laughs> yeah. if, if they're even I remember the like the local free weekly thing in my block that now it is just like gone like even the thing you would put the papers into are gone I, I wrote for all six issues of our free weekly in my uh, hometown. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, yeah. And also he passes by like a, a, a good sign gag. I never read before the non phallic eclairs. That was uh, as funny. <laughs> uh, and yeah, also the background characters, so many great ones like that smoking couple that are holding it European style. Like they are so out of Portlandia. It seems like a background gag of that one guy doing like his street sale that the dude is holding a photo of him. It, it, he's like, uh, Oh, you robbed me and this is my photo uh, and yes andy is almost crushed to death in his first episode but he's so excited at the prospect of this date with gwen he doesn't even care and uh, he arrives in his building that's where we meet one half of the biracial alt- alternative couple of natalie and carlos very that comes straight from bill and josh's like actual friends but that also felt very like oh i'm in the big city where like uh my friends they're two different races and they're <laughs> married that's different watching it now i'm like oh i live in an old apartment now like andy and i have the same mailboxes that they do yes yeah you're so right <laughs> yes yeah actually this is not unlike your uh your apartment complex but my apartment is like a rat's nest compared to andy's <laughs> nice loft uh well and now i've aged into being the gus of my apartment complex <laughs> so uh but before we get to them i do want to say too i like that natalie and carlos are like their young parents who just have this uncontrollable baby and that everybody just deal with like yeah yeah it's an uncontrollable baby what you gonna do <laughs> and that he's drawn to just have like dot eyes like he's the mo- one of the most cartoony looking figures in the show too then we get to the first gay kiss in primetime American television, which uh, nobody noticed because nobody watched this. On SNL, they had jokes of two men kissing, so it's not like never before in television did a, a two men kiss. And I guess there was that kiss on Roseanne, but it was like non-consensual yeah, uh, gay yeah. woman kissing a straight woman. Yes, yeah, this, yeah. These were two gay men in love kissing, and I think mm-hmm. they got away with it because neither Wally or Gus is uh, conventionally attractive, I suppose. And they're very different types. Yes, yeah. Uh, here, let, I'll play the clip. Sit still, please. Calm down. Hey, Natalie. You want some help with those? Oh, thanks, yeah. Carlos and I have just been exhausted lately, what with the baby schedule and all the noise in this building. I know. I could barely get to sleep with the sound of Gus and Wally fighting. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> what are you looking at? We made up. Sorry about all the brouhaha last night. Eh, you've been in a relationship this long, you're bound to have a few beefs. We'd have a few less beefs if someone would learn to pick up after himself. I said I would use the hamper. Enough! (laughs) So, yeah, I guess Wally is based on Wally Cox, just in appearance and demeanor, and Gus is Tor Johnson and Lawrence Tierney. (laughs) Yes, yeah, based based in part on their experience of working with Lawrence Tierney uh, in the Mars Be Not Proud episode of The Simpsons. A very terrifying couple of hours. (laughs) Uh, Mm. Now, now, Wally Cox, uh, yes, he was not gay was married to women though uh marlon brando said the two of them fucked uh but uh it, wally cox was like yeah it's just a lie no 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 and he's really drawing on like the paul lindy kind of uh affectation yeah i think yeah. it's it's like if paul lind played underdog that's that's kind of the voice that tom kenny's going for hmm, i could see that yeah and also of course they're based on uh, oh yeah he was underdog yes i well, totally I forgot about that <laughs> Duh. uh but 
but uh, but yes, Wally and Gus are also based on viral audio recordings of the late '80s and early '90s. The uh, "Shut Up, Little Man" tapes, as and they were called. There's a documentary about that that's been on Netflix for like 15 years. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I have a. Uh, if you want to hear a little bit of them, here's a clip of it from the documentary about how uh, the how these tapes came to be. You've been screeching for an hour now. Stop it. No, I haven't. You lie. Stop it. A piece of shit. You dirty you little man. A piece of shit. You've been smelling the All you are is a piece of shit. I smell like a human being. You smell like a fucking dog. Shut up, little man. <laughs> so yeah, I guess uh, they were inspired by Mo being based on the tube bar tapes. Yeah. We played a bit of those on, I think, Homer's Odyssey for this. They take the Shut Up Little Man tapes, which uh, were recorded in late 80s San Francisco. Mm. It was Peter and Ray were the name of the two gentlemen. One passed away in 96, the other in, I believe, 2000. So oh, geez. long, long gone, these two gentlemen. But the real people, Peter and Ray, the effeminate one was gay, a very gay man. The other one was a super homophobe who called him awful slurs in the Shut Up Little Man tapes. So this takes the idea of like, well, what if those two guys were actually a couple instead? <laughs> so that's who, uh, who Gus and Wally are. Though they don't look anything like the, the real life Shut Up Little Man guys. They're just the audio inspiration. I mean, it's so perfect how Gus is Tor Johnson that they where they take it in the final episode yes it's so great but you know yeah as a young person watching this coming to terms with my sexuality i do think i really even then enjoyed seeing like this stable mature couple of wally and gus who you know this is played as a joke some in this episode but these are real people with real with a real long-term relationship who are uh they're in their 50s or 60s i guess actually if wally was a director in the 50s and he'd be like 70 and 90s i'd say suppose but i love gus's little hats like all the little stuff they put on his head <laughs> so so funny there'll be a knife there later yeah oh god Quit you fussing. <laughs> but yeah wally and gus i just i love them every scene they're in i love it is like an interesting tour mm-hmm. of like here are all the different people you will meet mm-hmm. and it is rather really shocking for someone from the suburbs to like yeah. go into this world like i remember when i first moved out here like a few years have passed and i was just talking about my life visiting home my sister was like uh where do you live i was like i live in a house she's like you're renting your own house i'm like no i live with roommates and she was like do you know them and i was <laughs> like great. uh no they just had a craigslist ad and she was like how do you know they're not murderers i'm like well i'm still alive <laughs> and then there people are shocked by like things like you know getting on a bus or riding a train it's like all these things are very shocking if you live a shelter's life like i did growing mm. up so like seeing all these different kinds of people is a good way to get into this world the city world yeah yeah it was a big wake up for me too of living alone and uh, going from a very white sheltered suburb like Kevin does in this episode to living in this uh, you know more much more diverse alternative lifestyle area especially with you know you compare this to the lily white suburbs of Springfield like yeah. Mission Hill very very different like where I grew up uh, I didn't meet an Indian person or like an Asian person until I was in my 20s wow yeah <laughs> super super yeah. super sheltered one of the stressors that this pandemic has removed from me is my family calling me to make sure I'm okay when they hear about anything that happens in California. They'll be like, they'll, they'll call me and be like, I heard there was a fire. And I'm like, that was literally 600 miles away. I am fine. That's in Northern California. And now they call and I get to be like, oh yeah, I might die. You're finally right. Because like, even when I lived over the bridge in Philadelphia, they'd call me and be like, don't walk around with your headphones on because someone will mug you. And I'm like, I'll be fine. Now I get to be like, Oh yeah, you're actually scared for your life as well. So we're we're actually <laughs> connecting. You're not annoying me anymore. I think uh, Midwestern parents don't know how big California is mm-hmm. because it's like they assume my apartment mm-hmm. behind me is Disneyland, my backyard, and then right to the right of me is the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the Mexican border is just like a few feet away. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so uh, after we head upstairs, we get to see Andy grab his first beer. It's the Maestro, which I like the Mission Hill. Instead of just Duff, there's multiple fake beers in this world. Gruberhoff. Yeah. Maestro mm-hmm. is more of the red stripe. Well, it's a malt liquor, really. It's, it's in a malt liquor bottle there. We get a good view of this two-story loft, and I'm just, I hate oh. every person who lives there. Maybe hate Gen Xers. Yeah. Like, you didn't know. <laughs> you didn't. Well, I mean, these characters are the ones gentrifying this neighborhood. Like, these That's are true. the gentrifiers, our lead characters. These three white people live in here. Yeah. The and only then, problem I have with this apartment, other than the just the, what's not a real place that I could ever live in, but... 
where's Posey's room? You ever think mm. about that? Yeah, because Kevin yeah. has his own room too. I'm more bothered by the fact that there's like an open window between uh, Andy's room and the rest of the apartment. Yeah. Like just the window shade. <laughs> I don't like that. I love that. I've always wanted that. <laughs> uh, but yes, why don't we meet one of the roommates? Hello? Down here. <laughs> oh, hey. What's going on? Want to drive me out to my parents' house? They're moving tomorrow and I have to go pick up the dog. Right, your dog. Hey, does he still get drunk like when we were in high school? Mm, are you kidding? Dad had to spray the liquor cabinet with dog repellent. <laughs> I'll get the keys. <laughs> Ow, what happened to the couch? We moved it over there last week, remember? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the family's moving? Your little brother, too? Kevin? Oh, yes. He'll be a thousand miles away. Did you know he had a t-shirt made with his SAT scores on it? How did he do? I don't know. I don't care. I didn't look. Much better than me. That song that was playing, that is the uh, Couldn't You Wait acoustic version by the band Silkworm. Hmm. Uh, but huh. yeah, uh, Jim. Love Jim. He's, I mean, he's another of those TV stoners that can't smoke weed on yeah. television. But we all know. Although I think at one point he talks about eating a brownie oh, he found a on the subway. Joke. I, there's also an amazing joke that I think about all the time where he says something and Andrew just says, what are you, high? And then there's just a close-up of him staring at him smiling for like 10 seconds. Oh, yeah. That, <laughs> really yeah. long shot. <laughs> I think it's just the joke is that Jim is constantly high. Mm, and yet the most functional of any of the people yeah. there. It's and, a pro marijuana show. <laughs> he's a great, I mean, he's a great guy too. He's just like, if I lived with one person who had a car and I didn't have a car, I was just like, hey, want to drive upstate? They would be like, uh, no, I have work in the morning. Like, fuck you. <laughs> like, mm. <laughs> I like characters who are comfortable with themselves, and Jim very much is that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And he's such a cool guy wearing his bowling, like, vintage bowling shirt. Oh, I bought a lot of those in the <laughs> early 2000s at Goodwill. <laughs> I also like that he seemingly breaks his back, and uh, but doesn't yeah. care. And it's <laughs> it's one of the first times where so much of, like, the old-timey, like, Fleischer Brothers-style animation kind of bleeds in, and I just, I love that spirit of it, that, like, he has twinkling stars around him and and later you know a hot thing of coffee will have dotted lines coming out of we're it. about to get into it like a cloud fight yeah yeah <laughs> an old-fashioned I, cloud fight you know i wonder if the show had continued on like we, we <laughs> when, when we're watching season one of simpsons there's animation choices that made sense to them before they started broadcasting that then they changed their mind on and they wouldn't do in later seasons i, I wonder if they would have you know, kept doing this, embellished it more, pulled back from it. Like, I love the spirit of it here. I'd hate to think they'd get rid of it. But, you know, shows change and evolve over time. I wonder if this kind of, these kind of choices would stick around. Uh, we, I have points to oh, make yes. about that, that clip real quick. There's a great voice actory moment of the voice performance working with the animation in there that I don't think I've ever noticed before. When he asks Andy about going upstate, Andy's drinking from me, he has... And Andy starts talking before he takes the 40 out of his mouth. And he goes, hmm, the way that you do when you're oh. taking a thing out of your mouth and having a conversation. And I had never hmm. noticed it before, but he's talking into his beer for a second and then pulls it away from his mouth. Oh, it that's looks, a nice it choice. Really, it's one of those things you don't get those two sides of it, the animation and the performance working well that way together. That has to be from someone who knows exactly how to make cartoons really well. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a very subtle touch. Yeah, yeah. And and as they drive up, you also you hear about Kevin before you meet him, which is a good you know process for introducing the character. And I believe on the commentary, Bill confirms that these are his SAT scores. Like uh-huh. he's, little Harvard uh, boy. Eh? Yeah, <laughs> I mean these uh, we these are two Ivy Leaguers. That's why like uh, you know they are Kevin. They're not Andy. They're they're Kevin who want to be Andy and relax some like I have a feeling these characters like they hoped that Kevin would go on the trip they made of overly logical borderline libertarian asshole kids to grow like relaxing some and realizing like oh this I, I'm a fucking loser this sucks a theory that I had about Andy and Kevin while watching this uh, I don't think they knew it when they were writing the show but I think this is very much a like Gen Xer versus millennial kind of show Ooh. where Andy is a Gen Xer his boomer parents had him when they didn't know what they were doing they fucked up he just had to figure stuff out on his own but with Kevin they're like Kevin's a kid we're gonna actually parent and they were helicopter parents to Kevin which explains why they're so different 
That makes a lot of sense. And Kevin uh, yeah. is the millennial, and Andy is a Gen Xer. That's why Kevin is being tasked with learning the piano and all these things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ke- their parents uh, make a few appearances on the show. The dad definitely feels like, uh, as, from a similar vein, is all their great Skinner stuff. He's a boring man, or maybe a little, uh, he's like Chalmers and Skinner rolled into one. While the mom is just like a guilting Jewish mom. Yeah, like, I'm yeah. not sure what they were doing with the mom. I'm not, I'm not quite fi- a big fan of this character. I mean, it's it's Tress doing her usual yeah. like, guilty mom. Like, she's she's really good at this uh, kind yeah. of stock character. I was like, uh, the show's a lot of nuance. I wish there was more nuance to the mother. <laughs> Uh, I mean, they get more sexually free as the show goes on. That is on. true, yeah. So I like that. But the the mom is also making TV dinners, which I think is a nice touch. Like it feels it feels like they ask themselves, oh, well, they're moving, so they haven't been going to the grocery store, so they just make instant dinners for everybody. It also seems like uh, mm-hmm. they won't let Andy say no to this request. So at the end, the act break joke is when are the movers coming again? Uh. Like <laughs> the movers are about to show up. That's right. So yeah. they're getting Andy at the last second to give Kevin to him <laughs> and the dog. And uh, yeah, and great uh, background design here for like a house that is moving where like all the cabinets are open and bare. Like they put a lot of thought into what what your house looks like when you're about to not live there anymore. And uh, we meet Stogie the dog, who uh, named after a real dog who was named Stoli, which is a real Mm. vodka brand. And apparently WB wouldn't let them use that, so they changed it to Stogie, the nickname for uh, types of cigars. Which, uh, it works too. They, they both work as a dirtbag dog name. Uh, I love that he's like, every look on Sto- Stogie's face <laughs> is just a brain dead dog. It's a, it's a fun drawing of yeah. that dog. <laughs> he's, he's 10 times stupider than Santa's little helper. Like, and, and much more lethargic. Like he's, he's just a more realistic version of where they go with, uh, with Santa's little helper. Uh, but yes, why do we meet both Stogie and Kevin? Jeez, Mom, his brains are damaged enough as it is. Come here, boy. It's okay. We're going to have so much fun in the city together. No more mean Mom and Dad. I'm going to take care of you all by myself. Uh, You know, it's funny that you mention that, uh, because, uh, uh, well, would you be willing to... Did you tell him yet? Hi, Andy. So, guys, are we going to be your roommates? What? Kevin, honey, please go wait in the other room. Here's some fig boss. Wait a minute. You want Kevin to come live with me? It'll just be till he graduates and goes off to college. You see, he wasn't thrilled about moving to Wyoming and... uh... Were you ever planning on consulting me about this? You know, I have better things to do than take care of my stupid kid brother. A 1460 combined SAT is not stupid. A dog who eats mothballs, that's stupid. A dog, I might add, who you're rolling out the freaking red carpet for. But your own brother who loves you, he gets a knife in the back from Andy French. Look, Kevin and I have never gotten along, and... (laughs) Honey, we're taking the piano. You don't need to practice anymore. (laughs) That's a cute joke. Uh, Just show you what a nerdo he is. Yeah, God is. I love how he enters the room before he's called into. Like that's good comedy timing on him. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and, and the first of two Scott Joplin references in this episode. Oh, that's right. What a fucking dork man he is. And I <laughs> also, when she hands him fig bars, those are clearly fig Newtons. Like yeah, it's the, but uh, that feels like another uh, Bugles is like the only brand they're allowed to say mm, in the show. Made me hungry for Bugles, but I can't find them anywhere. Oh, man, I, they're probably all sold out on Amazon. Amazon right now. You gotta make those bugle fingers, eat them <laughs> off that way. Kevin is such a well observed, like annoying smart kid. Like he's smart in all the testable ways and has no emotional intelligence or life experience, but he's he's just this like little asshole. Yeah, like, very judgmental. Yeah, which I can get why Warner might have had a problem of like this is an unli- this is an unlikable character. He is very much the you know while you were out partying, I was st- studying the blade yes. kind of character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I mean, it gives you a place to watch him grow and learn to like um, respect women or uh, see that drinking isn't bad in in and of itself. Yeah, the mom is a little uh, boilerplate, I will say, though. I did like the animation choice, like, a knife in the back. Like, she acts out a stabbing, like a downward stabbing of a knife. Like, that's cool. I did like that. I did like uh, Andy, like, cradling Stogie's head and, like, flipping his ears up and down. Oh, yeah. His giant head. I like when big dogs just have giant skulls. (laughs) 
And Andy's saying the things he should in a in a heartfelt sitcom. Andy would be saying those things to Kevin, like oh, "I'm going to raise you all on my own." Like we don't need mom and mean old mom and dad. But yeah, the the flopping dog ears, like that's so great. I like too that they got him in high school, so he's like a seven year old dog. So he's not a young dog, and he's pretty fucked up from eating <laughs> um, drugs, pretty much, and drinking liquor. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, I guess Andy is young enough to still have his childhood pets alive. After yeah moving away it's uh, it's an interesting age gap for them of seven years like i'm three years separate from my younger brother so we were kind of babies together we're closer in age but like uh, for andy like he went off to borchmore when kevin was 11 yeah. so he missed a lot of his uh his teen years good old borchmore the the parents are ready to be empty nesters like right now like they they want to be rid of it and i like the mom at least uh, talks him up by telling him he's uh, my big cool baby cupcake do i even have a choice no not really kevin come in here andy would love to have you come live with him son we're very proud of you for being so mature ow crap you did that on purpose you little creep well, your big feet were in the way. Mom, he said crap. Because you broke my damn feet and you're not even sorry. What the hell? Okay, you're losing your mind. I'm getting away from you. Come here. You, ow, 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 ow. They'll be fine. <laughs> what time do the movers get here? <laughs> Parents are very used to this. Uh, God, all the cartoony sound effects. Uh, the one I had missed before until listening to it now was the sound of his foot, like uh, vibrating with pain, yeah. Yeah, sizzling with pain. Yeah, love that. Uh, the and again, yeah, a big cartoony cloudy fist fight. It's so cool. I hope uh, you know had it continued, I would hope they'd only keep this going. These animation choices. I, my my sister is uh, three years older than me, and I remember like physical fights with her. <laughs> Where uh, she was bigger than me, like, and intimidating and, like, getting her mad and just, like, barricading myself in my room and pushing against my door. She was trying to force her way in to beat me. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I think I was on the other side of the door with my little brother in those situations. <laughs> I mean, brothers and sisters physically fight, too, but I guess it's less uh, covered in media than I brothers think so, fighting. yeah. It reminds me of, like, it's also, it's covered on uh, South Park with Stan and Shelly. Yeah. Like, yeah. I was like, that's accurate, but I think it's harder to portray, like, sort of like uh well man woman violence it's not as comical like yes, if yeah. uh, kevin was uh, his little sister or something or andy was uh kevin's big sister and they were physically like fist fighting on the ground it'd be like ugly and weird yeah yeah i could see that being uh, how do you make that funny to watch as opposed to like that's uh masculinity in america for you i guess it's like boys will be boys it's not a tragedy that they're kicking each other in the face here yeah <laughs> so we go to commercial break come back they're driving into mission hill uh that was the opening clip i do think andy's saying like there's nothing you'd like here about mission hill that almost feels like they're telling people to not watch their show <laughs> it's like oh you think you'd like <laughs> mission hill well there's nothing you'd want to watch that's why i didn't watch it i was in the kevin demographic <laughs> And also uh, another moment that really reminded me of my childhood was Kevin talking about seeing Il Postino with his parents because I, <laughs> I was taken to a number of Oscar nominated foreign films with my mother as well. <laughs> mother. We, we enjoyed so many. Mother. <laughs> But yes, that's how Kevin thinks he's uh, very cultured, as he saw Il Postino. I like they have a little fight, and then Jim wants to pull over, but it's just to pee, not to turn the car around. I, I, it feels like they're getting close to home. He can't just hold it. It's like... Uh, is he filled up on Jim free is free. He, yeah. He's comfortable with himself. That's true. Yeah. And when the, when the need comes, he's just going to pee in an alley. Stop his car, pee in an alley. Uh, but so speaking of free people, the very free roommate Posey is introduced in this mm. next clip. Oh, my, oh my God. Uh, uh, that wolf is attacking my plants. Shoo. Go on back to the woods now. Shoo. Uh, Posey, that's not a wolf. That's my dog, Stogie. And this is my brother, Kevin. They're both coming to live here. Oh, a female roommate. <laughs> I've never lived with a girl before, but I assure you, I am a perfect gentleman. Yes, I can tell by your inner light that you're a good person. But, Stogie, there are dark forces at work within him. 
Love that mm-hmm. music sting. <laughs> the zoom in, on, like they zoom in on Stogie and then back to Posey's face. Just like. a very dumb look on his face too. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Vicky Lewis plays Posey so funny. Like she's, it's a little bit of the stock hippie thing, but she brings her own kind of spirit to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a unique voice. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's the character on the show I kind of like the least though because mm-hmm. uh, I feel like um, it's a little too close to Phoebe for my taste, and mm, I they, see that. they can't yeah. do too many interesting things with her because she's not really a comment on this type of character. She just is this character yeah yeah i i think her most intense story was when she started the produce uh yeah thing. and yeah i think I, they would have found good things for her or ways for her to grow in season two for sure yeah though i don't know i you know now i'm imagining a fifth season of mission hill i could see posey just falling farther and farther back into the background because there's there's not or she'd have to change jobs or something there's yeah i see that but i like how just the noises she makes when Stogie like is biting and like, ah, ah, what? like uh, yeah, so I, her little anxious noises are fun. Mm-hmm. And she calls him a wolf. <laughs> yeah, she <laughs> she thinks uh, it's a wolf. And uh, the way mm. Kevin introduces himself to her too is is very like he's never talked to an adult woman before that isn't his mother. It seems like, and uh, but you can tell he likes girls but doesn't know how to speak to them. But I feel like her character is very it, it's it's. Now that I'm thinking about it, it is also very Phoebe in the way that they give her complexity is she is this free yoga hippie, but she is very drawn toward like capitalism and possessions and things. And mm. she's constantly fighting about that. There's an episode where she like goes inside of herself and meditates for the whole episode. And yeah. she like wants a cool Miata and stuff. <laughs> and <laughs> and then also, yeah, the one where she sells vegetables where she realizes like, oh, I can sell these for a huge markup and make a lot of money and fuck over uh, the bodega who was mean to me. And also like one of my favorite screenshots of the show is her holding the sign that says, welcome to the real world sucker. Love that. Uh, she yeah. just like, she like she wants to be a little mean, but she won't be too mean, but she definitely like enjoys fucking with, with them the way that they enjoy fucking with each other. And she, I can, you can tell that she wants to be a part of that but also does stick to her guns and will be a hippie. Yeah, that, that's true. The things that make her stand out the most from Phoebe. Now you've ruined her for me, Bob. I just I'm think sorry. she's Phoebe. But <laughs> yeah, the things that make her stand out the most from Phoebe is when she is like actively mean in ways Phoebe would not be on Friends. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and how much she seems to kind of like enjoy it. She has like kind of a wicked. There's a wickedness to her that comes out that is covered by her touchy feely brawless uh, whole act she has. <laughs> uh, yes. Then we head to the school. If there's one character I could cut out of Mission Hill, it's probably Griffo. Oh, that uh, character. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know he had a name. Uh, I think he has to say his name out loud because he's like the witness in the arson thing. Oh, uh, it's, it's Tom Kenny doing his voice he did in that Transformers movie. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of like right. uh, Glip Glop or whatever his name oh, was. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably less yeah. racist than what Michael Bay did in yeah. the movie. <laughs> Griffo and Sea Dog, I think, are the two bullies. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, I just look, I get it. And I get what the joke they're going for is that this is supposed to be like, this is an inner city school. Like, this is, he's basically walking into the set of Dangerous Minds. And there's like a pregnant student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's not yeah. like, there's, I, like the critic had jokes like this that were meaner. I don't think this is as judgmental about the lives of inner city kids. It's, but, uh, Griffo with his, you know, dragging trousers and uh, general look, and also being played by a white man, it it feels mm-hmm. a lot more loaded, and there's a ton more baggage with his character. Like, I don't think Bill and Josh would do nah. this now. No way. But hey, it was 1999. Everything was pretty bad then. <laughs> Get a weigh-ins in the room. They're just uh, floating around that studio, right? Yeah, just have some crossover with the way. Maybe the weigh-ins were on the outs with them. They just canceled Wayne Head or something. And they're like, we're not helping you guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but I do like that Kevin, in a very realistic to a high school dork trying to be funny, goes like, enjoy the skiing competition. <laughs> like his little stupid jokes are so perfect for this kind of character. Yes, yeah. Though his laughter is annoying, but yeah. that's that's part of the guy. It's highlighted in the in the title sequence, so you know what you're in for. Yes, yeah. It can push you away instantly. If uh, <laughs> then we meet Toby and George, uh, that's uh, played by Bill and Josh themselves, or J M Weinstein, and he's mm. he's credited for SAG purposes. That's okay. So I didn't realize this was them until I watched DVDs again in 2007. Yeah. After hearing their voices on the commentary so much, I'm like, oh my God, it's Josh and the other guy's Bill. 
Yeah. And they should do more voice acting. They're really great voice yeah. actors. They should have been regular voices in Disenchantment as well. It's a, a mistake. Yeah. They have just, they have funny voices. And I, I know Bill said for many years, his daughter would tell him to repeat lines. He said as George, like, so. <laughs> not ethnic variation. <laughs> Maybe not that one, but I am not stinky. Yeah. That, that was his daughter's favorite one of him, but, <laughs> but goddamn, like J- Josh is so, I mean, these also come from them being giant dorkos. So yeah, I just, and Josh does such a great husky nerd voice. Like he's it's like, <laughs> He's he's can barely hold in his breath because he's just he's he's Fatty McGee, you know yeah. that's who he is. And I can, I can say this because <laughs> I was the Toby of my group in high school too. <laughs> uh, but yes, why don't we uh, meet Toby and George? Oh, okay. Have a good time at this ski tournament. <laughs> Excuse me, were you asking about room four ten? Because I'm on my way to four ten. <laughs> oh, thanks. I'm Kevin. This is my first day. Uh, I'm picking up something with my obviometer, Captain. No, duh. (laughs) (laughs) I like that one. (laughs) Kevin, this is George. George has a girlfriend in Singapore. Ah, Singapore. At my old school, I told people I had a girlfriend in Canada because it's so far away no one could ever check. (laughs) Is your Singapore girlfriend the same thing? It's a more believable ethnic variation. Stop (laughs) bragging about your girlfriends. (laughs) I like his distress. <laughs> yeah, the stop. Toby is knows they're fake, and he is just yeah. fully. He's still like, stop bragging about them. the fake Canadian girlfriend thing is sort of an old joke, but it also reveals like the, how sheltered uh, Kevin is. Like he thinks Canada is so far away. Yeah, because he's all like he lives in like what kind of like upstate New York or whatever. Like can't be that far away. Yeah, yeah. I well, it's all over the place. Yeah. Where this is, but yeah, it's it's not that far. But they, I love George's like more believable ethnic variation. Yeah. That's so funny. And, and some mm-hmm. Canadian girlfriends are real. Yes, so yeah, I've, don't judge everybody. I've, I've met yours. I can I can confirm she's a real person. Hey, some people just want to live in a better country. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, I mean, also, too, George is an Asian character. Like, so, I mean, you know, maybe Bill shouldn't be playing him either by today's, you know, more informed standards. True, but, but not doing a voice. He's not doing a voice. Uh, his dad character is a voice. Uh, uh, yeah, but who plays his dad? I think it's Nick Jameson as well. Uh, okay. Yeah, but uh, we'll, we'll get to him. He's in, grandfathered in. Sure, <laughs> yes. <laughs> With Khan. Yeah, Khan, Apu, all, the, all our favorites. The God, the the little noise Josh makes, like, bleh, 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 like just uh, <laughs> God, so the, these were the guys. Like this, this is who they were. And now, yeah, Dave Thomas is the teacher. Yeah, they're their old mm, boss. Yeah. They love Dave Thomas. He gave them their first writing gig. It was this. Uh, if you go back to our uh, Homer versus the Twenty First Amendment yes. episode, we talk about it. They worked on a reality show parody with Dave Thomas. It was reality shows of like nineteen ninety. Yeah. So like yeah. lifestyles uh, of the rich and famous. Yeah. And things like that. <laughs> That's, he'd go on to be Rex Banner, and now, but that was just a one-off appearance. Now they can get him a regular gig on on Mission Hill, and Dave Thomas is just a great actor. Like he's just a funny guy. He's still still with us, knocking on wood. There, he's not that old. Eh, you know, he's not he, young either. That's true. <laughs> But uh, approaching 70, known for his like impeccable Bob Hope impressions. Yeah, God, so good. And uh, SCTV, of course. Yes. Uh, well, and of course, the, the icons of Canada, talking about Canada, icons of Canada. Yes, yeah, the Strange Brew. Yes. Those yeah. guys. Uh, yes, he's playing the, the fed up teacher type. And uh, this is when Kevin introduces himself to his, uh, his classmates with uh, a couple of red flags I recognize now in his introduction. Oh, yeah. All right, people, settle down. We have a new transfer student joining us today. Kevin, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello, everybody. My name is Kevin French. I moved here from Briarhurst, or as you probably know it, Exit 18. (laughs) I live with my brother Andy, who is a cartoonist here in Mission Hill. Some of my interests are miniature golf, Robert Heinlein novels, and collecting novelty neckties. I have an extra Dilbert tie if any of you would like to trade. (laughs) <laughs> Dilbert and Robert Heinlein like that. Yeah. This is a conservative genius. He's, he's a kid. fan of great thinkers, Henry. Oh, That's yes. what I'm saying. Yeah. 
and also like collecting neckties like that is that's tucker carlson behavior man oh like, yeah this, <laughs> this show i see this show as it's about hip people deprogramming a, a young republican that's yeah. what i see it as. like if andy didn't intervene he'd be ben shapiro yes, at this uh, point in history this, this is the, honestly ben shapiro at 16 he was in harvard at yeah. that point like oh. in kevin's age yeah <laughs> that's the worst person in the world one of the worst uh yeah the and then nobody pays attention to his little speech and the the rest of the class hates him because they're given a pop quiz on his his life uh but yeah you get to see that he also does not fit in with the rest of the cool hip urban kids around him and uh i love him rethinking his his self-conscious laugh there <laughs> then we head uh back home we get to see kevin enjoying his bugles i think i've heard bill complain that they never got any free bugles despite mm. putting them in the show so prominently i just want to eat bugles now <laughs> yes kevin even tattle like after having a fight with his brother which goes so real like you are so lame go away you lost this fight like that's a very sibling conversation but i like it kevin is such a crummy kid he tattles to his mom over the phone and and also the way he's just like you're having one beer you're, you're losing your mind you're on un, you're uncontrollable you're drunk <laughs> That is a, such mm-hmm. a shelter. I, I love the young nerd's uh, stance on drinking. It's so accurate because mm-hmm. I was like that. It's like, that kills brain cells and I want to keep all my brain cells. <laughs> That's for waste oils. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I literally like got into huge arguments as a senior in high school because I the first time I smoked weed, a bunch of my nerd friends got mad at me. And uh-huh. I was like, what do you, fu- we're 17. What the fuck is wrong with you idiots? We, we got programmed by all the just say no stuff. Yeah, you know? I didn't drink yeah. until the legal drinking age. I'm not yeah. swear <laughs> i i didn't have any friends who were like big time drinkers but they would do it occasionally and they in a very kevin situation at 20 they told me like just get drunk like once so you can say you got drunk while you were uh, it was illegal to do it and you can have mm-hmm. some story and i didn't get high for the first time until i was like 27 too like so or tw- eh, 25 25 it was mm-hmm. and still not that many times i've been stoned uh but <laughs> uh but yes also we get uh we get a uh, the closest to wally and gus becoming their shut up little man characters yeah. <laughs> in this sequence i don't think you should drink if you can't drink responsibly what Okay, you've had too many drinks. You're getting abusive. Will you get lost, you douchebag? You're the one who's acting <laughs> douchebag. You are whack. <laughs> you don't know what either of those words means, do you? You are so lame. Go away. You've lost this fight. No, I haven't. Mom and Dad would like to speak to you. Honey, is everything all right? Um, well, no. No, not really. I, I don't think I can take much more of this. Kevin is driving me nuts. Oh, he just needs some time to adjust. Yes, I imagine your neighborhood is a bit different than what he's used to. New condoms. What's wrong with our regular brand of condoms? Nothing, but these were on special, that's all. You cheap gay bastard. These things are going to fly right off. <laughs> fly right off. Where, where do they fly right off from? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, that's another thing that uh, people, uh, sheltered people like I was, couldn't imagine. Like, strangers are just acro- uh, like a wall across yeah. from you. I hear my neighbors every night not arguing. I just hear their TV <laughs> and them talking. It's just a fact of just being crammed together with people in the city. <laughs> Uh, though I've been thinking about this bit for a while, though, like, you know, Wally and Gus seem to be in a pretty exclusive relationship. And at their age, I mean, I, I, protection is good, but do they need it if they're if they're monogamous? I, I mm. that, that gives me a question. But then again, maybe they're more open than we know about. Could be. Yeah. Know? Or 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 one could be, you know, a, a positive. They could one could be HIV positive and doesn't want to share it with the other. Like, it's not just that they're being overly caught. There, uh, this condom tells a lot of stories about them, <laughs> what I mean. I mean, the way Cus says it's going to fly right off. I can't not conjure the image. Oh, yeah, it's of, perfect. Of it's the, like, yeah. across the room. Uh, and uh, you cheap gay bastard. What a great, what a great <laughs> epitaph. And now it's just destroying Kevin. Like, he's never had to think about gay people in his life. And now he's getting the most intimate details <laughs> about their uh, sex lives. 
<laughs> uh, and so the next day, Andy's at his last nerve. They're heading off to hear Ska. Ska. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love Ska. Where uh, I see, I being a Kevin Nerdo, though, I still had heard about Ska because Real Big Fish was advertised very heavily to me mm-hmm. in 1999. But other than that, I didn't know what Ska was. We were living in a post-basketball world at this point, I think, right? Mm, Boy, you know, 99, yeah, yeah. it was basketball 2000. That was was like 98. They did it before the South Park movie. So, yeah, the real big fish uh, version of Take On Me was on that soundtrack. Yeah, Yeah, okay. (laughs) And Uh, Beer, I believe. I think Beer is the song they perform in the film. That's right, yeah. Guess I have myself a beer. beer, Yeah, Yeah, Ska was mainstream at this point, Yeah, (laughs) I think. My deeper understanding than Kevin was that Ska was only played by white guys in their 20s and mm. they they invented it as a as a genre ska <laughs> i got into ska oddly like just for one year it was 2005 it was an odd year to get into ska wow. just like just one year my ska year <laughs> a I, that's about my year. ska intro year too i feel like i feel like that's when i get real into it and it never left it's still there <laughs> you stay true to ska not like a sellouts i think the most ska like band i listen to still now is probably the aquabats <laughs> yeah um, speaking of sellouts oh um, all right you guys uh, I also like the way Andy mentions all the normie, like Gordon Lightfoot, the Beatles, like Kevin doesn't know music, but cause he's fucking a child, man. Like you're supposed to Andy. It's really his failure as an older brother for not teaching his younger brother better music. And instead just going like, oh, you like lame music. I'm not going to teach you. That's, that's the, what older brothers are for. There's a lot more I'm reading into the show now that I'm watching it again. And it's like the history is that, yeah, uh, Andy went to college when Kevin was like 10 or 11. And so for a long time, Andy was just this like cool older guy, like living this cool life. But like he was so out of Kevin's life. It's a it's a good place to start a you know story about characters that they get to learn about each other and grow together. Mm-hmm. Uh, as as Kevin learns to lie to listen to ska. I shouldn't be in here. I feel guilty. I'm in here under false pretenses. <laughs> Sit still and stop attracting attention. But what if they ask for my ID? I could get arrested. Then I'll never get into a good college. All because I wanted to hear ska. Crap. <laughs> the bouncer's coming over. Be cool or you're going to get us all kicked out. Good evening, gentlemen. I see some ID there, sir. Oh, oh, how flattering you should ask. <laughs> Ever since I shaved my beard, <laughs> everyone has been... Sir, if you're not 21, I'm going to have to ask you to... Oh, God, it's happening! Please don't arrest me! <laughs> I want to go to Yale or Amherst! Don't call my mother! I didn't know! He made me do it! <laughs> Andy should be dead from hitting that fire hydrant. Like that. <laughs> Just have teeth knocked out. <laughs> Maybe that's what loosens his tooth. Ah, yeah. yes, it's mm. all it's all a premonition here. <laughs> uh, that's but, a great uh, vertigo shot when uh, when Kevin's freaking out with the background going further, g- the background closing. In, we close yeah. in on him, and the background gets further away. Uh, and I also want to mention, uh, you know, we're all talking about what ska fans we are. The logo for that band, Silly Rabbit, is fucking awesome, and I feel I feel like a real band should have that. Yeah, yeah, that, I oh got, well, just the design sense in general, like, it comes through in everything, like, from, from Silly Rabbit to the idea of, like, this realistic dive bar slash club called Backwash, like, that's oh, great. I love it. And yeah. now they're all, like, cast in blue light inside, it's very dark, and this reminded me, yeah. like, of a very Kevin-like experience where I was there legally, I was seeing a show when I was 19, but, like, going to a local bar for the first time to see a show, like, by myself, I was like, it was terrifying, <laughs> it was like a new world. Oh, God, oh, God, yeah. Crossing yeah. the threshold into adulthood. <laughs> Uh, mm-hmm. And more Gen X uh, referencing of uh, pop culture ephemera from your childhood, like naming your ska band after a serial commercial mm-hmm. is also yeah. a yeah. Gen X thing to do, I think. So informed, like, yeah. <laughs> like recontextualizing things through irony, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And great cartooniness, like on on Andy's freak out of the steam coming out of his ears, plus Kevin's shaking wallet with uh, all the coins flying out of it. God, I <laughs> I also feel like, uh, as we know, uh, in Bill Bill Oakley stuff, he likes to mock Yale, so I think that's why <laughs> Kevin says Yale instead of Harvard. <laughs> He's like, that's how lame Kevin is. He'd want to get into Yale instead of Harvard. He has those Porsche manners. <laughs> They head outside, and this is a a big turning point in the episode. And Wally Langham does such a good job acting here, and the posing, like the animation is right there to meet it in, in Andy's big speech about what it's like to be an adult. Well, congratulations, you little dork. You've ruined my whole life in less than a week. I didn't shut up. 
<laughs> I did you a big favor by letting you move in with me. You should be down on your knees kissing my ass. Oops. I'm sorry. I said ass. Please tattle on me. Please give me a preachy speech. Won't you show me the way, Reverend Goody McFreaking Gumdrops? Mom and Dad said. Mom and Dad aren't here. They're a thousand miles away. Why don't you take advantage of that? Stop ruining my fun and have some for yourself, for God's sake. You're right. That's the first time you've ever said I was right about anything. That's the first time you've ever been right about anything. <laughs> uh, but seriously, <laughs> it's time I start taking advantage of all this freedom. Do things I could never do with Mom and Dad around. That's the spirit. Good. Now let's get home so I can start masturbating. <laughs> It yeah. is good. And I love that, like, the camera is, like, rotating around yeah. Kevin as Andy rants and, like, is also walking around him. It's really good. Yeah, it's a very yeah. ambitious shot and it works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as, it, as the reality dawns upon Kevin. So I guess up to this point, he never masturbated because he could never, his parents would always <laughs> be around. I'm guessing that's hard for me to believe. Even for a pent up nerd to think that by 16 or 17, he hasn't uh, manipulated himself. That seems uh, that seems unlikely. I think now he just feels freer. Perhaps so. Yeah, he's. I mean, now he can look at the internet uh, whenever he wants. He doesn't have to worry about mom or dad walking in. And uh, it probably yeah. happened by accident once or twice. Oh yes, yeah. I mean, I would say. as uh, as the classic Rick and Morty line goes, like uh, you know, I'm a kid. You did some roulette opening the <laughs> door in here. Yes, so they come back from the break. Kevin is in full dirtbag mode. He stayed up all night. He's not even embarrassed to be seen in his underwear by posing. Oh, man, these incredible slouches they have are just mm. the They're straight out of hate, the way these characters have yes. terrible posture. And I got to say, real hero slouch, because the world is resting <laughs> on our shoulders. <laughs> uh, I feel like I was very influenced by just the way they stand and their general demeanor, and I'm actually noticing... Uh, hearing that clip of Andy yelling at Kevin isolated, I'm like, oh, that's my passive aggressive mean voice. Like, was I, <laughs> like that's a, that's the way I yell at my girlfriend. Like, is this uh, wow. is I that influenced by this? <laughs> oh, did I say that? Ew, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, how, she's also sitting next to me and laughed at that, so okay. it's okay. It's all right. It's also the first of the like blank McBlank jokes. <laughs> yeah, like goody or horny McWhack Whack. I was bummed that I couldn't use that is my line because it's not from this episode <laughs> uh matthew stop talking about your girlfriend <laughs> uh i i'm left out here in this girlfriend conversation uh so. <laughs> the government won't let me see mine <laughs> uh but uh yes even posey can see that uh Kevin has lost his inner light and another great little animation bit of Andy just stands there. He's like, Hey, could you give me coffee? And she just keeps talking. So then he just tilts it up himself to pour himself some coffee. That's uh, there's, there's great little animation gags there. I, I love that. And uh, then we come back to Ron's waterbed warehouse and Andy and Gwen are still having some flirty exchanges in bed together. It's cute. I wish it had like the uh, the animation of a waterbed. It feels like it just mm. throw on a solid mattress here. Waterbeds are disgusting. Yes. My yeah. sister had one. <laughs> Ew, yeah. Yes. Uh, Andy and Gwen, they reestablish that they're going to get together uh, at this party. And the personal calls thing also is a running gag. Or at least there's a second gag that follows this up in a funny way of Ron really hating when Andy gets a call at work. So Andy, though, it's called into the principal's office and kevin is in trouble mr french i've called you here because kevin was caught sleeping during his fourth period ap chemistry class when awakened he flew into a rage and called the teacher a a graphic expletive (laughs) Uh, what a foul term this this is what he called his teacher (laughs) 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 sir I don't know how you did things in the suburbs, but we don't use those words here in the inner city. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I've just, I've never seen it written so neatly. <laughs> oh, my. Perhaps I should just call your parents in Wyoming and discuss discipline with them. No, uh, no, no, that no, won't be necessary. Crap, no, please, I'll punish him, I promise. I'm going to give you some serious discipline, uh, young man. <laughs> See that you do. Kevin is suspended for the rest of today. That was a great laugh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't like his pants falling down joke. Not yeah. that I'm the biggest fan of that. But the rest of this is very fun. I mean, I also like that the 
you know, African American principal is telling him like, it's maybe how you do it in the suburbs, but we don't use that language at the inner city. Like it's, <laughs> uh, it's fun. And also douchebag written out in cursive. That's, it's just a funny image. It, though did Kevin take Griffo's pants and hat? Like, what, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't know what happened odd. there. Then it cuts to them at the liquor store or at the grocery store. Discount in the food aisle. hobo. Yeah. Oh, this that, reminds me of like, uh, entering the world of drinking and like asking people like, well, what should I drink? Like, what's this? What's that? Yeah, you know what? I'll do that. I miss uh, I miss those days. Now I just have I know the three drinks I like, and I don't want to try new things. If I though I'm not a regular drinker, Bob, you're quite a uh, a beer uh, snob. I'd say I, I would go that far. <laughs> Check me out on the Untapped app. <laughs> You're you're up to try any type of beer. You're very I I am jealous of your gourmandness. Put it in my veins, especially now. (laughs) When I first lived alone, well, with a roommate in Berkeley, I went to the discount food outlet that's uh, (laughs) like right under the overpass. If you know where it is, it's closer to you than me. Oh Uh, yeah, yeah. This looks more like a Whole Foods or something. The the Mm. wine aisle they're in. Yeah, that's true. It's a very well. You know, uh, the wine aisle at Trader Joe's here is pretty big. True. You get the unhoused and people who are wine moms. Like they're all walking through there for their wine. They can steal meats. a bottle as a treat. <laughs> I'm bringing it back. That meme's coming uh, back, folks. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but yes, it's time to go shopping for alcohol. I'm glad you got suspended. I could never carry all this booze home by myself. Hey, uh, will you buy this for me? I want to have some beer at the party. Now you're drinking? You're pretty serious about this new attitude, huh? Yes. Excellent. Because I was afraid you'd wuss out. But drinking shows a real commitment to becoming a cooler person. (laughs) So will you buy me this? Sure. But that's olive oil. That's maple syrup. That's shampoo. Look, if you want a good first beer, try Gruberhoff. That's what I started with. A nice cheap beer. Like, don't waste money on this kid's first beer. It'll all taste the same to him. It's very observational, the kind of, like, self-destructive drinking that happens in most people's 20s, where it's just like, it's just a normal thing. You're drunk every day. And then (laughs) at least one of the weekend days will be ruined because you'll be too hungover to do anything. (laughs) You don't don't realize that's called binge drinking in your 30s. Or you never realize it in some people's cases. And those are tragedies. Uh, You know, something I really got a sense of in this episode, watching it now... So in the early seasons of Simpsons, they actually do have some idea of like, well, I have X amount of money and we money's tight. Like they keep in context, these realities for Andy, him saying like, I could never carry all this booze on myself. This is a joke about how he doesn't have a car and he has mm. to walk home his bags yeah, of groceries. That's like, true. It it makes that clear with the character. Like he has to borrow cars in other episodes. Like I'm glad they they keep that clear. It's an important fact of him being an urbanite, as the, as one would say. And I haven't owned a car in 15 years. Don't miss it. It's also funny to see on network TV Andy approving of underage drinking. It's great. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty edgy that Kevin gets drunk in this episode. Yeah. Yeah, like first episode your main character gets drunk and and it's not exactly a very special episode about it either and the time cut of the moving yeah, like, the Gruber that's so Hoff. cool yeah that's a great uh the arm wipe <laughs> yeah arm wipe yeah and also though as the party begins toby and george were exactly my friends except they'd be talking about anime instead of what mm. they talk about in this next clip Hey, guys, welcome to Party Central. (laughs) Uh, You dudes want a beer? No, thanks. Drinking is for wasteoids. We don't need liquor to have fun. Not when we have the Babylon 5 collectible card game. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, great apartment. Thanks. There's a rumor that Sid Vicious once threw up in the bathtub. Betcha. Uh, hello. Oh, hi. You must be Kevin. How do you like Mission Hill so far? <laughs> it's far out. I, uh... Oh, I... <clears throat> excuse me. I'll be right back. Hey, man. Play off the Gruberhof. That's my private reserve. Who the hell are you? I'm the Grubermeister. And that's all you need to know. Now get out of here before I kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Those are some of my <laughs> cartoons. And those are some designs for an animated TV series I was thinking about. Oh, God. Not another animated series. <laughs> I know. It's like everyone and their brother has one now. That's also true today. Oh, yeah. It's ten times yeah. as true. Now, yeah. every every streaming platform has five animated series, like, a day, it feels like. And that shows you where... 
Babylon 5 was at in 1999. It's like, Star Trek is so such a lame reference. We need the dorkier one. Like, well, then it's mm-hmm. Babylon 5. They were really tapped into nerd culture of this time because, you know, collectible card games. Uh, this is right after the Pokemon collectible card game exploded. Magic yeah. was around. Oh, yeah. There's an episode mm-hmm. Matt mentioned earlier about an MMORPG, which was mm-hmm. a new concept to TV viewers at the time. Like, they were very ahead of things. Oh, and their Comic-Con I- episode? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to mention uh, that is another hyper specific nerd reference of the time, which is everything having a collectible card game. And mm. I bought into a lot of them, like not just because before this, it was trading cards. You would get cards based on every fucking TV. There was probably like a chips uh, trading card oh, yeah. collection, but they were just screenshots with some flavor text or maybe some stats about a character. This is the time where like Pokemon and Magic were so big, so every especially anime. Oh yeah, uh, got like this is the time. This is the same year that the Dragon Ball Z trading card game, which I uh, played for <laughs> a long time, launched, and like they all wanted to be Magic or Pokemon, but you can't be exactly that. So they would change the rules a little bit and make it way harder and worse to play. Uh, so I I learned the rules to a lot of terrible card games that I played once and never played again, <laughs> but still bought all the cards for. I, I feel lucky to have avoided the CCG uh, craze. Like, my friends didn't get into it. We we played tabletop RPGs, so it's not like we were cool. But uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. I didn't get into that. But you're right, yeah. When, when, I, was your, when I was your age, Matt. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. when, but when I was nine, trading cards were the thing. And I bought every Marvel trading card I could. I Series one through four, I had them all in a, in a binder. And I, I cherished every one of them. You're right, Bill and Josh, very pleasant plugged into what actual team nerds were into then like new and this was as the internet was still young they still had that information and uh, i forgot they set up the sid vicious thing like uh mm. early here that's mm-hmm. right the degradation of kevin like him uh, getting to play drunk this early for a character got it had to be pretty fun for scott menville and like the first episode he gets to play him drunk i did like the uh the dotted line from andy's eyes to gwen's butt yes as she's yeah. looking at his art <laughs> you know it's it's a very mature for 1999 thing i remember on news radio as well like the ross and rachel characters like had sex in the first season but this is like first episode they almost do it and i like that they're both like like yeah we're adults we are both interested in each other we both know what's up going to a bedroom to look at drawings (laughs) let's drop the ruse though i like that it's when andy looks at her butt that he's like oh wait a minute i stink and so does my bed oh shit (laughs) like though though gwen you know clearly she must like andy because she's like oh this stinky mattress oh well like let's i'm dtf all, all the same I believe Bill Oakley has said that all the all of Andy's drawings in the show were drawn by him. Oh, okay. Wow. I know no meat cool. touching was him. I yeah. know that one. But I think I think all of them. It almost is a little too clever, the uh the uh, everybody's got an animated series now kind of thing. Because for the for your first episode of your animated series, especially when you're about to be canceled. Yeah. And there's actually no animated series. There'll be one more episode uh, this year for you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but who are they to know? So as Annie and Gwen are starting to uh, get down to business, we cut back to the guys dancing in their fun house party. It's some real like peanuts kind of dancing. Yeah. There. We didn't talk too much about the opening, but I love Jim's like crazy dance in the opening. Yeah. With his like head, like head, like hunched over and like mm. moving his arms all crazy. I'm, I'm miming it now. It's yeah. awesome. And his legs kicking up. Too. Yeah. I love that. Well, Though in the opening, Andy's like push and pull dance. Yeah, and and like the wavy arms too. Uh, Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And though I think my favorite in this shot is is Wally's like little head bob. Like that's I in general I like that Gus and Wally are not like their mean neighbors who hate the kids. They're the cool old gay guys who get invited to the cool kids party. Like I I like how welcoming it is to them. Though Gus isn't feeling very welcomed by Kevin Uh. in this one scene. And I know you're gay, okay? But, like, I don't even have a problem with it. All right, already. Because history is full of great homos. Oscar Wilde was a homo. Alexander the Great was a homo. (laughs) And you know who else is great? You, you big homo! That is a hurtful term. Please stop using it or I will be forced to clobber you. Bite me. <laughs> All right, everybody, scoff! <laughs> hey, who wants to get it on with the Goober <laughs> 
Meister, huh? You do. Huh. Sexual harassment. Kevin's a real creep. Uh, Kevin. Man, I, I just like that. That scene with him and uh, Gus is great because like Kevin now has confidence because he's drunk and he's just like, I'm in a city. I'm talking to a gay guy. This is awesome. And we're cool with each other. <laughs> yeah. I can call him a homo. <laughs> And uh, it's like, no, you cannot call him a homo. Gus is gonna, it's gonna clobber you. I love he says clobber, like, because he's also the thing. He's, he's yeah, the, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> just in the ways that Lawrence Tierney is the thing. He is the thing. <laughs> Especially like, I love the character of Gus. That for him, being gay is just part of him. He's not sad about being gay. He's not fraught with it. Like when he's, we'll see in in a future flashback that like him falling in love with a man is not is kind of meaningless to him like he's just like yeah i fell in love with a man whatever he's also he's also comfortable with himself yeah so it, it, entirely too comfortable with yeah. himself really <laughs> but yeah i also like that kevin's coming at him from the history nerd kind of way just like actually i know lots of gay people in history did you know this person was gay did you know this person and uh yes you uh you've mentioned that ska song before matt do you know the, i don't know anything about the toasters but uh yeah well oh, there's a very deal? important fact about the toasters which is they did the theme song to Kablam. Oh, oh. Well, I know that song very well. I do too. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great song. Uh, a lot of people think this song is the same song, but it, it's not. This all ska song. songs are very nuanced <laughs> and different. They don't yeah. all sound the same. <laughs> I will say no. uh, Sleeper Hit Band, uh, the hippos are good. Look up the hippos. <laughs> Oh yeah, I agree. Uh, no, this is "Don't Let the Bastards Grind You Down" by the Toasters, which is a uh, awesome song. I love this song. Yes, which you won't be hearing on the DVD, but uh, no. the joke works the same. With it's just like they just have a kind of library music ska riff. Uh, either way, you get to see Kevin make a complete ass of himself trying to dance around. Uh, and I also like Stogie takes direction from Jim and bites him when being told to bite me. So in a way, he's a good dog. He listens. Kevin then thrusts his hips towards uh, the ladies at the party. I'm hoping he got slapped off camera right after that. <laughs> Man, then we get to sexy town with uh, Andy and Gwen in the bedroom. Like, I like, uh, you know, Andy is just drawn as like, uh, you know, a not terrible looking body, but just the, the body of a man who in his 20s, who doesn't <laughs> exercise, but doesn't eat too much. Scrawny and malnourished. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, just, you know, a weak, a and weak I, man. I just like her vision of him and his like uh, underwear too she's like yeah all right we're doing this <laughs> like and yeah uh, like uh i like how in the scene uh, she is the more like engaged person yeah. she's just like the more confident in bed mm -hmm. person yeah she's really like dude come on we're both ready like let's get to and he keeps being distracted she's like you know please like uh I, I'm kind of on Gwen's side. Like, give yourself 10 minutes to fuck. He's not going to die by then. And then once <laughs> once you're done, then you can walk away. Like, at, at least have a quickie. Uh, but uh, they even get away with a little bit of boob on uh, yeah. TV there. Though no nipple, obviously. Yes, uh, I guess, though, this scene being extra sexy makes it all the more important to get to see Andy's sacrifice. Like, he's given up a sure thing to, uh, to help his brother. The brother he's been hating this entire episode. That is Kevin. Well, he's probably a little drunk. Forget about it. I'd feel better if I could just check. Cougar Geiger? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do not feel better. You will in a second. <laughs> I promise. <sighs> I'm sorry. He's my brother. <laughs> I love his little face there. Cougar <laughs> guy here. What's he saying? He's saying he's the Grubermeister. Do any of you have a problem with that? No, 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 no sir. Not at all. Good. Now I think it's time for you to leave. Get out of here, Bill Oakley. Yeah. <laughs> just it's yeah. Bill Oakley doing his own voice, drawn as him. And Josh is there too. Yeah. Drawn as they were like when they were 33 or however old they were at the time. Uh, I love that. I love yeah. his uh, little his little beard and mustache. That's and his current uh, Twitter avatar is himself in his early 30s. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was before. That Bill couldn't have imagined being the Instagram star he is today. 
the one thing I think about though in that scene is like Andy must have had like a boner he had to tuck away yeah. while walking out to save his brother. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sorry I bring it to, to Boner Town. I was just thinking logistically, <laughs> no. he's like to step out of bed, he's he's got to be at least like half there. <laughs> <laughs> I also uh, I'm jumping around the episode as we get to, toward the end of the episode. I've been just jumping around looking at some of the shots, and uh, we were talking about the color design earlier. And one thing I I didn't remember to mention is uh, when they're going into that bar that Bob mentioned, there's like this blue light on everyone. The shot of Kevin walking into the bar, the color, you see him walk from the outside light, from the like checking the ID bouncer light into the bar light. And it just looks, it looks great. It's had exactly... 12 minutes and 20 seconds in the episode. Just if, while you're listening to this, if you're looking at it, <laughs> just look at that shot, please. It's very well observed and uh, uh, very detailed. And that kind of color change in a pre-digital show is, is pretty impressive, too, that mm-hmm. they they pulled it off uh, very flawlessly. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, yeah, when he saves his brother, I actually do think he's right to chase off those guys because he's like the last stragglers at a party just watching a basically a child roll around drunk on the floor go write a tv show losers (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh but yes uh it comes to the next morning kevin is hung over and he's like sorry for being so pathetic and he's like hey cheer up not everybody can beat sid vicious like uh it's a touching ending here i'm sorry for being so pathetic hey cheer up it's not everybody who can outdo sid vicious Mm, here you go (laughs) is everything okay yeah, he just got a little carried away is all. It runs in the family. Every time somebody put down a cup, your dog ran up and drank it. <laughs> well, I, I better get going. See you tomorrow. Well, I guess my experiment in being cool has failed. Miserably. So, you gonna call it quits? It's too hard being like you. I don't know if I can do it. Maybe you'd be happier just being the old Kevin. Well, it's certainly the easy choice. Is the douchebag aspect going to be a problem? (laughs) I can learn to live with it. Thanks. And um, let's just try to forget about last night. Oh, God. (laughs) At least Mom and Dad will never find out. Sunday, 3.30 a.m. Yo, dudes! It's Kevin! Hey, could you send me my birth certificate? Because I want to change my name to the Grubbermeister! (laughs) I love being drunk! I want to stay drunk forever. <laughs> what a great line to go out on. I want to stay drunk forever. I. <laughs> you also get to see that Gwen, you know, he didn't totally blow it with her. She gives him a little kiss and uh, got him some coffee. Well, she's there in the morning. So yeah. who knows after what happened after they put Kevin to bed? Hmm. hmm I wonder. <laughs> yeah. I, I get the sense that he babysat Kevin all night just to make sure he didn't like choke on his own vomit. But I took it as Gwen just slept in his bed while he stayed up all night. But, uh, Later, Andy will totally blow with Gwen, but not yet. Mm-hmm. Though I, I would bet if the series kept going, she'd just keep appearing in the show. I don't think she's just like his season one girlfriend. Mm-hmm. I feel like a much. Uh, I feel like any lesser show would have her storm off uh, and probably also make a gay joke about him. I yep. think at this point, but like they let her just be like, no, I understand that circumstances are circumstances, and he had a thing to deal with, and it has nothing to do with me. Mm. Comparatively, in the pilot for the critic, the uh, <laughs> uh, his girl, his love interest for that episode does brutally dump him and to, uh, because he uh, stood up for his morals. It, it's a similar <laughs> situation, but less respectful to women, I would say, in, uh, in the critic pilot. He had a lot of bad uh, girlfriends in that first season. <laughs> yeah, some who yeah. didn't even get names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah, you, don't need to, you don't need to name a woman character. No, no. <laughs> but, uh, who needs it? <laughs> man, great first episode, like a pilot that sets up every character, a Amazingly sets up the whole town, like, uh, and creates the entire situation of Kevin and Andy living together. Like, it does everything a classic, you know, iconic pilot does for a TV series. Like, these are all pros working at the in their prime. Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's fantastic. I can't wait to explore all of this mm-hmm. on uh, the Patreon. So check it out there at patreoncom talking Simpsons. Matthew, please let us know what you're doing now, how we can support you, and about your great podcast. Thank you. And thank you again for having me. Of course, I, as we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, I, I love Mission Hill so, so dearly. I love the show so much. And I hope that this gets a lot of uh, people who didn't get to experience it on the WB or Adult Swim uh, to check it out. But 
Uh, yeah, please, I make the deep end with my friend Steve Yurko, where we are going through every show ever aired on Adult Swim, including Mission Hill. Uh, we did a whole episode about that with our friends Gene and Casey, uh, who are two actual cool young people who live uh, in a cool town. So Steve and I, as the nerds, as we've talked about in this episode, <laughs> got to ask them you know, what that's like. How real is this? We also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash the deep end where we do a weekly show about the Venture Brothers uh, and a monthly show about other Adult Swim-ish shows like Clone High and Downtown and a mm. lot of the shows that we actually mentioned on this episode, Golden Boy, uh, Archer. Also make Cartoons 101, as you mentioned. That's where I interviewed Bill Oakley and other people like Scott Gardner and Evan Dorkin, who is an actual 90s indie comics legend, uh, like the ones we mentioned that inspired this show. Uh, that's at Patreon.com, so Cartoons 101. I also go through series on there with a bunch of guests like uh, the works of Satoshi Kone and Avon Gellion, uh, Ralph Bakshi, uh, just did Don Bluth, and now I'm doing non-Disney Renaissance 90s animated films. I had Alec Robbins on to talk about a goofy movie to kick the series off. Uh, he's Mr. Boop, if people ah. are, from, are familiar with that. Uh, mm-hmm. and he, he goes real in-depth about where Mr. Boop came from, uh, what it is. He breaks kayfabe. Very in-depth interview about it for about 20 minutes. So oh boy. check I, that out. I really enjoy that, Matthew. I was behind on so many podcasts now that I have nowhere to go and nothing to do. I've been listening to a <laughs> lot of podcasts, and I just caught up on almost all of yours, and I love the Goofy movie when you did with him. And, and, and thank you so much, Matt. Thank you, Matt. So thanks again to Matthew J for being on the show. Please check out his stuff. As for us, if you want to check out more of our stuff and support all of our podcasts, please go to patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. So yeah, signing up for five bucks a month gets you everything behind that $5 paywall. That includes all of our limited miniseries, but that also includes Talking Mission Hill. The rest of Talking Mission Hill will be on the Patreon behind the $5 paywall. If you're listening to this episode on the Talking Simpsons free feed, episode two of Talking Mission Hill is already there waiting for you sign up now you'll get it immediately and then you'll get an episode of talking mission hill every week after that until we run through all 13 of them Mm -hmm. Uh, plus if you want to upgrade from five bucks a month to ten you'll get access to our premium once a month podcast what a cartoon movie where we talk about a different animated feature film once a month in april castle of cogliostro the first miyazaki directed film based on the lupin franchise it's a ton of fun and action-packed movie that has a interesting history to it and if you sign up you'll be able to hear that one and all the previous ones lots of great stuff there over 60 hours of podcasting content just from the movies alone a great thing to do alongside all those limited series we talked about patreon.com slash talking simpsons is where to sign up so i've been one of your hosts bob Mackey. you can find me on twitter as bob servo i have another podcast by the way outside of this network and it's called retro knots that is a classic gaming podcast find it wherever you find podcasts or go to patreon.com slash retronauts to sign up for five bucks a month to get two exclusive episodes every month two full-length episodes that are only on the patreon at patreon.com slash retronauts every month henry how about you Follow me on Twitter at H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G. Whenever new stuff happens in my life, I'm sure to tweet about it with fun images from uh, cartoons or also depressing thoughts on the news. Uh, Lots of different things. (laughs) Plus, if you enjoy this podcast, you should be really following the official Twitter account of this podcast network. At Talk Simpsons Pod. That's at Talk Simpsons Pod. You'll stay informed on all the current events whenever new podcasts go live on the Patreon or the free feed. Follow it on Twitter at Talk Simpsons Pod. Thanks so much for listening, folks. We'll see you next week for Krusty Gets Busted, and we will see you then. I think it's important to embrace as many ideas and cultures as one can. Mom, Dad, and I went to see Il Postino and... Shut up you are so lame shut up maybe you should shut up no you i'm not the one who's all right you two i'm gonna pull this car over right now what don't let me stop your arguing before shopify were you wondering where are my sales at now you're selling with Shopify, the global commerce platform supercharging your selling. You have no problem selling online, in person, on social media, and beyond. Gary, easy on the cha-ching. <clears throat> oh, sorry, but my Shopify sales are through the roof. Start selling with Shopify today and discover how millions of businesses around the world use Shopify to ignite their selling. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com listen. Shopify.com listen.